of the Planning Commission of December 2nd, 2020. And uh, for those of you who are uh, guests, we welcome you to this evening. And if you are joining us um, in the video, you can observe the uh, slide that's on the screen right now that will tell you how to actually get into the meeting itself if you would like to do so. Um, I'm going to start by uh, actually giving you a, um, uh, a declaration about this meeting being online. I, Brenda Shear, Chair of the Salt Lake City Planning Commission, hereby determined that conducting the Planning Commission meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. The World Health Organization, the President of the United States, the Governor of Utah, the Salt Lake County Health Department, Salt Lake County Mayor, and the Mayor of Salt Lake City have all recognized a global pandemic exists related to the new strain of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Due to the state of emergency caused by the global pandemic, I find that conducting a meeting at an anchor location under the current state of health emergency constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at this location. Um, so tonight we will be hearing, we'll have five uh, public hearings on various projects which are part of the agenda, which is available online. And uh, we we'll start with the report of the chair and, and the vice chair, I do not have anything to report. Amy? I have nothing. Thank you. And now we'll have the report of the director. Thank you. Um, sorry. I don't really have anything to report tonight. Well, that's that's good news as always, since we have a big agenda. Yeah, okay. let's get to it. So let's get to it. So our first Public hearing tonight is for the Izzy South Design Review Special Exception at approximately 534 East 2100 South. It's a request by Ryan McMullen for design review and special exception approval to develop a 71 unit mixed use building located approximately 534 East 2100 South in the Community Business CB Zoning District. Um, the presentation will be presented by Caitlin Miller. And it's case number PLN PCM 2020-00222 and PLN PCM 2020-00655. It was tabled from an earlier planning commission meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you members of the planning commission for attending this evening. I'm happy to see you all. And of course, thank you to the many members of the public that we have in attendance this evening as well. We're very happy to have you as part of this process. And then if I could um, please have presenting rights, I'll pull the presentation up. Thank you very much. Oops, my apology is wrong presentation. <laughs> All right, as our chair has indicated, this project came before the Planning Commission on September 23rd, 2020. It was tabled by the Planning Commission to allow the applicants some more time to investigate increasing the setbacks of the building from the rear property line. Uh, to further articulate the neighbor space or the quasi-public, quasi-private space that is the front patios along 2100 South, and to uh, increase the architectural treatment of the western and eastern facades of the building. So the applicant has returned with some uh, further setbacks from the rear property line. The um, the second and third floors used to be set at the same setback from that rear property line. 
The applicants have increased that in sections of the building so as to increase the um, the modulation of the structure at the rear of the property and hopefully to increase the um, the sense of privacy of the backyards of those neighbors at the south end of the project boundary the applicant has also responded to the planning commission's feedback regarding the articulation of that semi-public semi-private space that is the front patios for the um, units along 2100 south as you can see they have added some landscaping at the back of the property line and have added some three and a half foot tall um, landscaped planters to sort of delineate where that um, public space ends and where the private property begins. Uh, the applicant has worked with a landscape architect in order to ensure that all of the landscaping materials that are to be planted in these boxes are um, kind of used or, or bred to be used in um, confined spaces so that they will thrive and they will not just um, kind of I guess uh, die out as time goes on. So those plantings are expected to survive and thrive well in those planter boxes. And finally, the applicant has increased the mix of architectural materials on the Eastern and Western facades. The two renderings at the top of the screen were the original renderings of the Eastern and Western facades on the left and right respectively. The applicant has returned with the images on the bottom. So you can see the renderings of both of those ends of the building with the surrounding buildings along 2100 South and the additional increase of a variety of materials on each of those ends. And that was to, to increase the uh, visual interest of this project as it will be one of the tallest buildings in the area for some time until the rest of the block develops. And that is the end of staff's presentation. If you have any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer those. Or our applicant is also on hands and they have a presentation for you as well. Is there any questions yes. for staff before we move to the applicant? Okay, can the applicant come forward and just um, basically yeah, so they don't even know I'm on. Hello? The yeah, applicant there? Justin Hepler should unmute himself. Or if, if someone could unmute him, he'll be presenting for us. Okay. Justin, you're muted. So can we get our... Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Can you state your name, please? Justin Hepler with AJC Architects, um, representing uh, High Boy Ventures here um, and, and presenting the project. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay. So uh, Planning Commission, we're excited to be back to present uh, to you the additional study and uh, development to the project since our previous meeting, uh, where we were asked to better study the human scale uh, against the sidewalk uh, with those patios uh, to dive into how we can create a, a better and stronger human scale connection or separation uh, from the uh, single family residence to the south and uh, to uh, show a continued development of the project uh, along the east and west uh, side elevations, side yard elevations. Um, we've added a lot of additional context in our renderings that we have uh, prepared to present uh, that uh, do a better job of showing the building in context with its neighbors uh, and, and the design efforts we've made to connect the building to the neighborhood. Um, we uh, are also uh, excited to show you um, the effect that the step back added that we added to the rear of the property line has uh, increasing 
uh, the presence or the, the reducing the presence of the building against the south property line. There's also going to be, um, I, I believe, continued uh, pushback against parking on the project. And I just want to state very clearly that we are not asking for any exceptions as part of this process uh, to uh, the parking requirements in the zoning code. The project meets uh, all of the parking requirements in the zoning code. Nothing is being asked for as part of this process. This is a design review process um, where we are being evaluated against the requirements of the zoning code and our compliance and consistency with master plans in the city. Um, and just state that uh, we very clearly feel that not only we are meeting the parking requirements um, of the city code, but we are exceeding them. Um, we would be required to park at 32% or excuse me, 50% and we're at 82%. So we're exceeding the city's parking requirements by 32%. Um, and now moving into the presentation, um, one thing that we did after uh, getting the feedback from the planning commission in the last meeting was really closely think about how or the planning commission and the public in the last meeting, how the project uh, handles its ex a presence against the South neighbors in relation both to the context in the existing neighborhood and uh, moves we're making that we feel like betters uh, what's required in the zoning and uh, you know the existing condition. So the, the street is very much a commercial street. You see on the east side of the um, block face, there's the unit golf with the parking lot that backs against three homes. Um, the UNA Golf is then very present uh, for about two sites. Uh, then we have the existing building, uh, which is basically an auto repair collection of buildings um, with the parking lot that faces 2100. That has a very uh, commercial boundary against the property lines to the south. A single family home is to the west of our site um, with a parking lot in back and then the gas station with a car wash that is actually a pretty good nuisance um, on its south property line. So this is very much and has been a commercial street. Um, and so we feel that not only are we bettering that by uh, developing the site uh, as a multifamily site, but in putting the parking underneath the building, we're actually uh, greatly going above and beyond, um, you know, the possibilities of other future commercial uses on this site. Um, I, then we were asked to really drill into uh, and explain better how the project has human scale that connects both to the public way along 2100 South and to the uh, properties to the rear of the site, the single family homes and the backyards. Um, on the 2100 South side, the project has been reasonably well received. We got a lot of positive comments in the last meeting and had very few, if any, uh, negative criticism. But but well, we work to uh, address human scale on this side by providing uh, a building that steps back in and out both vertically and horizontally and has opportunities uh, for connection to the sidewalk both uh, at all the stoops along the sidewalk and up above um, at the uh, third story uh, balconies that happen uh, between in between building forms. Um, and then we uh, were given the challenge of how do we connect uh, to the human scale um, and, and provide human scale to the backyard uh, with an also a charge to, to do what we can to uh, lessen the presence of the building along the um, south properties. Um, we studied a lot of different configurations to do that and decided that the most effective was a continued step back that went along the entire uh, property line adding one more tier back up at level three that uh, pushed the highest part of the building further north and provided uh, more uh, balconies along that side, which then uh, provided human scale and breaks the building down and opportunities for a, a blending of uh, the human condition. Um, to address the, uh, Caitlin did a good job of summing up the east and west elevations. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but do want to emphasize that we wrapped um, both, uh, we wrapped that step back of, around the corner. So that step back continues around the corner and uh, provides a softer presence uh, both around the corner and adds to the architectural character of the building. Um, and you see how uh, the existing buildings end up screening a large portion of uh, both of these facades. On the uh, west side, the west elevation, uh, Justin, I want to point Justin, out- that, Justin, if yes. I could just interrupt, if you can wrap it up pretty quickly, please. Okay, uh, I want to emphasize that the architectural gables tie into the existing neighborhood uh, and, uh, you know, play and blend well with the architectural character. 
Um, we, this, these several images that I'll flip through shows how we're providing that separation between public and private along the sidewalk. Um, there was a, a, a lot of public comments uh, at the meeting last time were about the intrusive nature of the parking lot. We believe we're going above and beyond by putting it under the building, providing screening um, from uh, landscapes, and then uh, this stepping back against the property line. You can see how less imposing we are than the existing commercial that is you in a golf and the and the gas station. Um, a view from the back parking or from one of the backyards down uh, west east on 2100 south uh, again from one of the backyards looking at how we've stepped that back so we're not as present on those uh, elevations and then when the landscape matures you see uh, over time um, that those trees will grow to be a very very good screen and then another thing we were asked about is to look at what was entitled on our property versus what could be done on the uh, southern properties uh, they could all go in and ask for an uh, ADU uh, in those properties, and this is about the scale they'd be allowed to ask for, um, which gives you some context that as these build out over time, they, that may be uh, something that is added to the rear yards. Um, like to wrap up with just a, a statement again, we believe that we have uh, responded to uh, the request of the Planning Commission to drill into the areas of human scale on the um, 2100 south elevation and on the south elevations um, feel like we've gone above and beyond the requirements of the zoning code which are under review in the design review um, in asking for a breakdown in the scale of the building asking for connection to the community asking us to um, relate to create architecture that relates to the neighbors and uh, we believe that uh, we have uh, and are presenting a project that is compliant with the code and then ask that uh, for the planning commission's approval tonight thank you Thank you very much, Justin. Does anybody have any questions for Justin at this point? Just clarifications before any commissioners have any clarifications before you open it up to the public meeting? Okay, we're going to open it now up to the public hearing. And do we have any uh, people who wish to make a comment? I see one person who wishes to make a comment writing down. Yeah. We, we do. We have, um, I believe, Judy Short from the Community Council. Ah, very good. Okay. Judy, you have, I've unmuted you. Go ahead. Judy? Hey, Nick. Yeah. While we're waiting for Judy, um, Caitlin Lutch, who has her uh, hand raised, is from the Liberty Wells Community Council. Okay, just one second here. Caitlin, I've unmuted you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me tonight. I just wanted to speak briefly um, as the chair of the Liberty Wells Community Council to the north of this project. Um, we've had the developers at our community council meetings now on three separate occasions, and the community has been um, largely supportive of the project. They did have some questions and concerns that were similar to the ones that have already been addressed by the Planning Commission um, and otherwise are largely supportive of this project. Um, we appreciate all the design elements the developer has planned. Uh, we appreciate the size and the scale of the project. Um, we like that they have a um, commercial space involved. Um, we really appreciate the human scale that they've incorporated into the design um, and feel that the project's location is appropriate um, based on the uh, proximity to public transportation as well. So I wanted to speak in support of Izzy South on behalf of Liberty Wells. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple other hands raised. Um, I'm going to really quickly try um, Judy again. Judy, you're unmuted. Can you hear us okay? All right, we can't hear 
Judy. So um, we may need to troubleshoot that a little bit. In the meantime, let's go to um, Joe Mason. Joe, you're unmuted. Thank you. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm in favor for uh, of additional community things. The thing I still think that, and I know you mentioned the parking, you feel like you have somewhat addressed it and within compliance, what you haven't addressed and takes into consideration are the impacts to the neighborhood. And the Zoning Commission has the general standard, the 21A52.060, that talks about this needs to be in harmony with a, and within the specific purposes within the neighborhood that there would be no undue adverse impact, which insufficient parking, which we have submitted and given you all the documentation, shows that there is definite negative impact to the neighborhood because you're not taking into consideration the number of cars already on the street, the number of cars that are showing up in the adjacent neighbor or the comparable apartments and condos and everything else around. The average place has one and three quarters cars based on the proximity. You're not addressing the adverse effects and how it's gonna impact everybody. And it also says that the director should check that and shall be granted only if the following findings are determined and will satisfy the parking demands. The, propo the proposed parking plan does not have a material adverse impact on the adjacent or neighboring properties. This has not been addressed at any time. It's not taken into consideration. And those zoning ordinances do work if you don't have it crunched into an existing neighborhood. If we were down by Winco and we had open spaces, that could, takes into consideration parking, availability, and spaces that are there. In this neighborhood, you are definitely adversely impacting the neighborhood, and we're not considering that when you have that. Just because you have the 50% and you're looking for exceptions, if you're looking for that, you need to be a partner with the neighborhood. You need to not become a tyrant to the neighborhood and make the neighborhoods be sacrificed because you want the bottom line dollar. We need to accommodate both you and our new neighbors and the existing people. We are thank gonna you. be forcing thank too you. many thank cars on the street. Thank you for your comments. Can we address them rather than just say thank you for a comment, please? We'll talk about them later with the applicant. Thank you. I hope so. So do we have any others who wish to speak? We do. Give me just one second. My computer won't move for a second. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Um, we have the next speaker is um scott boy i hope i pronounce your last name right dutre 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 <laughs> touche <laughs> thanks scott <laughs> so i live on commonwealth i appreciate the effort of the architects giving a little bit more buffer on the south side of the street on the north side of the street i should say um and i concur with joe i mean just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Um, the building's way too big. And to my comment with the Liberty Wells person, the other side is completely different. And you have a huge back set compared to what we have on our side. It's like almost like triple. I think you guys are almost like, you have a big, huge green space. We have 10 feet. And even though you're pushing the balcony back another four feet, they're still in your face. And I just think that you guys, instead of, you know, cushioning your pocketbooks, should work with the with the neighbors. It's a hard working class neighborhood that's been here forever. And all of a sudden we're gonna have this big thing, big huge thing behind us. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Mason? Oh, we already heard from Mr. Yeah. Mason. Is there anyone else who uh, wishes to speak? There is. Hey, for some reason, my computer is not opening anything at the moment. So 
Um, I believe that Shane Stroud has a comment to make. Shane, can you hear us? I can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we, we can. can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. So, no, Justin, Justin said it in his presentation, and he's right. Let me just echo my neighbors on the parking and say, you know, the problem here isn't what you can do, it's what you should do. You know, I too appreciate the, what you've done architecturally to add the buffer between Commonwealth. And we aren't, we aren't opposed to this development, you know, per se. We're happy to welcome new neighbors into our neighborhood. This isn't a NIMBY thing where we're trying to keep you out. But you're going to be renting apartments for more than my mortgages. Your studios are going to be renting for more than my mortgage. I use transit or did before the pandemic to get to work or I ride my bike. But I have a vehicle. I'm lucky to have a driveway where I can park that vehicle. But I've seen in the development that's gone on, on Wilmington and Six, just how much, uh, you know, folks moving into new apartments, how that overtaxes our streets. We are a hardworking class neighborhood. One of the fewest, one of the fewer uh, in the city that still exists to this day. And you are putting a huge building up here and you're not accommodating parking you can accommodate parking you have the money to do it you haven't and that hasn't even been addressed in the staff report i was talking with judy short about it, it hasn't even been addressed by the planning commission or the developers so, so to just say you can do it and and you've complied with what the city says you know uh it, it's not enough you need to do more and the commission should require you to do more and we would be happy to welcome you into the neighborhood if you just do the right thing here. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Yes, we also have um, Liz Schwab. Liz, I've unmuted you. Excellent, thank you. Um, I would turn my video on if I could figure out how to do that, but I can't. Um, but anyways, um, I moved to Utah in 2013, and I just bought a house four months ago at 526 East Redondo. So this would be right in my backyard. Um, I rented since I moved here in 2013, so I certainly understand the needs of having housing available for other individuals. I definitely understand that. Um, but certainly, just as everyone else has just spoken to, you can understand why I would be slightly concerned about this um, being right in my backyard, having just bought this house. And um, since I did rent for the past seven years here, um, I can tell you that even the houses um, that are on residential streets that are being rent out, parking is barely available on those streets, even with regular residents having their uh, one or two parking spots on the street. So when I come from an area of, of renting in these areas and knowing that there's limited parking in those situations, um, it just an additional comment, um, once again, on the parking, um, being concerned about that. Because um, my household, we have two people, we have two cars, and sometimes I can't even find parking on the street still. So this just makes me a little worried um, just because of that. Once again, completely understand we need more room for housing, um, would more than welcome more individuals, of course, understanding. I've been a long-term renter. I just want to make sure that the parking once again is addressed. So thank you for taking our comments. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have um, in the Q&A, we are going to go to um, Bob Farrell. Bob, would you like to make a comment? Uh, indeed, thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity here, and I live uh, on Elm Avenue between 5th and 6th, so just uh, two blocks away from the proposed Izzy developments. Uh, and, excuse uh, me, excuse me. You, we, are, we are not having, this, this particular thing is not about the Izzy development. We are on another project right now. Oh, I'm sorry, the Izzy. The 5th is, I'm sorry, pardon me. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I am heavily impacted by the current parking situation that the Brixton apartments have brought, in, brought into the neighborhood. Um, you know, those apartments there actually have some parking available for residents, whereas I understand that Izzy is not gonna have any. And with that, um, That's you know, not we had, well, 
yeah, you're going to have to charge people. So they're going to be parking in our neighborhood. And so um, what I would add, the Brixton, um, we have steady parking violations here. Um, I know personally, I have submitted and had several hundred people ticketed from the Brixton apartments just uh, over the summer and fall. And, uh, you know, it's dangerous to the neighborhood. The handicap and fire hydrants are almost constantly blocked. And that's with much more parking than the Izzy is looking to provide. So I just see a, uh, a real safety problem by adding more developments into this neighborhood without any parking. And it impacts us homeowners here and uh, decreases the safety of the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I'd welcome if that data could be pulled to show the literally, you know, if I've submitted hundreds of parking tickets there, I wonder if there's thousands overall that have been ticketed this year. So thank you very much for that. Alex. Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from the public? There are. Um, next up, we have Soren Simonson. So you're unmuted. Hi, thanks. Um, I want to just speak uh, in support of uh, the project um and uh seeing it move forward uh this you know seeing housing develop in an area where there's clearly great demand and uh in a way that's i think very consistent with our long-range plans for sugar house to become a more urban neighborhood i, I think generally is a good thing uh, I, i'm certainly mindful of a lot of the issues with parking and we're having, although I live much further east on 21st South and we're having similar conversations around 21st and 21st business district. The real comment that I wanna make is one that's probably directed more towards, um, you know, just how we build urban neighborhoods um, when we continue to see a lack of implementation of the infrastructure that supports people being able to live more car free. That's clearly the intention of the Sugar House master plan and the transportation uh, and other plans that are going on. But just earlier this year, when we had a great opportunity when um, this stretch of 21st South between 7th and State Street was being um, repaved, we failed to implement putting bike lanes and the first last mile infrastructure that allow people to conveniently use transit to be able to get from here to uh, either the bus route on 21st South, which the city's investing a lot in, or to the S-Line streetcar. And not having that infrastructure, as you can see in this picture, a four lane street that should probably be a three lane street with bike lanes and preferably buffered bike lanes. We just continue to not see implementation of the transportation needs to support the, the urban neighborhood that is clearly developing all along 21st South from State Street and, and, and the new State Street uh, redevelopment project area to Sugar House, which has been a redevelopment area with this intention for many, many years. So um, I, I would ask the planning division to continue working with community development to implement fully the vision for a connected, um, not not auto oriented um, network of connectivity so that projects like this can be successful and don't put parking demand on neighborhoods. And uh, I hope this project continues the evolution of Sugar House in a positive way. Uh, and I hope that the city is really fully behind uh, allowing the vision for Sugar House to evolve because we desperately need the infrastructure to support it. Thank you so much. Your time is up. Yep. Thank you. Next, we're, I, I see Wanda Brown's hand up. Wanda, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I live right behind Izzy South, and I my concern is the fact that the underneath is going to be the parking. And that parking is going to be so close to my back fence that I'm going to be and my back bedroom is back there where we sleep. I'm going to see lights coming through their fences. I'm going to hear noise pollution. I'm going to hear cars, people, 
all kinds of stuff in my backyard, which before I had this, not that you guys like this, but I had this ugly, glorious building behind me that had nobody there staring into my yard, nobody there polluting my stuff, albeit the 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 Jiffy Lube did pollute when they, with the oil and stuff, but that is my biggest concern, plus the parking as well, just my privacy. My privacy is gonna be completely gone, and I know that you guys have all those trees back there, but also the fact is, is with those trees, there's power lines are back there. I mean, there's power lines. I mean, it's just not enough room. You guys have such a big project and such a tiny space. I just think just because you can does not mean that you guys should. And if you're going to have a bear, uh, our barriers between the two properties need to be solid, not chain link, not anything that stuff and the, po the pollution and stuff can get through. That's what, that's what I would like to see, which I don't see in this. Thank you. Is there any other comments from the public? There is one user who typed a, a comment in, um, but I'm going to see if this person wants to wants to speak or not. Um, it was just echoing another person's comment. Icona Leafaya Tulagi, uh, would you like to speak? Uh, yes. Um, yes, well, um, thank you. Um, I don't know if I, is it possible to make two comments, but I wanted to make a comment about the uh, the uh, development in Rose Park, if that's next, but or can I make a comment about both of them or just one? Yeah, you can, you can make, make a comment on this one now, and when we okay. get to that other one, you can comment on that one. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for your time. And yes, I am uh, commenting to say um, that I have, um, do have residents in Salt Lake City and um, in Rose Park and um, family in this area and uh, the planning um, needs not to just needs to think um, not about how who is defining community and if that's only defined it, it, it's far more than a parking lot but how that um, that is um, accessible um, to working class families that my family does live here and um, what will that take away from our community um, in um, rents and um, going higher and who is going to be kicked out and who is going to stay. And um, there have been, that's, we are the, the communities that have built this community in which people want to come here that have much more money. Um, and just because, just like everyone has said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Money does not make a community. People want to come here because of the community that has been built here by people, by um, families, by hardworking, uh, working class families. And so um, please do not uh, sell out and sell out our communities. Um, you are here to serve our community, not to always develop and develop, uh, which means to be bought and, and to sell us out as communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I know that Judy was having some issues with her microphone, and I think what she was able to email comments to Wayne, who was going to read those. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, this is for Judy Short, chair of the Sugar House Community Council. The landscaping that has been added is much improved and stepping back the upper floors on the south side is an improvement. Not even considering a taller fence is not very hospitable. The lack of parking makes no sense. People are not riding the S line and the neighborhood is over parked as it is. The city has not moved the needle in terms of providing a reliable frequent transit system for the city, much less this neighborhood. I hope there is room to park several bikes in each unit because that will become the most convenient way to travel for these tenants. The outdoor space for the south building is across 2100 South. How fabulous is that? A real draw to live in this building. The Sugar House Community Council Land Use Committee and the neighborhood thinks this project is unsuitable for the neighborhood. And that was from Judy Short. Thank you. And Judy Short is the community council or the uh, representative of the community council, Sugar House Community Council. Yes. Is there any other, uh, are there any other persons wishing to speak on this uh, project, on the Izzy South project? 
it appears that everybody whose hand was up or who indicated in the Q and A or the chat that they wanted to speak have, have has spoken. So, all right. I guess we could give it one last call for anybody who hasn't who hasn't had that opportunity yet. If you want to, please let us know, and we'll go from there. Thank you. So, seeing. Uh, no other persons who wish to speak. I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the Planning Commission for discussion. Uh, Madam Chair, I should note that we have um, a call-in user who is actually Sarah Urquhart, one of our commissioners, that we cannot move for whatever reason into the panelist. Um, so, Thank she you. can mute and unmute herself, but we can't move her over. So just wanted to make make that for the record. She's listed as call in user two. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Sarah, for coming. <laughs> Madam Chair, do you want to give um, the applicant a moment to respond to the public comments? Mr. Hepler, would you like to respond to the public comments? I would. Thank you, Brenda. Um, again, thank you uh, uh, to the Planning Commission and to the public who's continued to be part of this project. We have uh, had an ongoing conversation um, with the community councils. We were at reaching out to them before we were even officially part of the Planning Commission process asking to meet. Um, and, and, and we believe the project has been reasonably and fairly well received architecturally by the uh, community councils. Um, the Liberty Wells, or yeah, the Liberty Wells, it, it was a great uh, opportunity to have a dialogue. Um, the Sugar House Community Council um, generally was complimentary of the architecture, but had some concerns about the building's presence against the south side and uh, wanted to continually have a dialogue about parking. So I'd like to address parking first, even though it's not under review today. Um, the unit mix of the project is very high on studios. It's not, they, we are continually compared to another project um, that is a new project to the South. Um, we believe that we have a leasing strategy that is going to manage that. That's for the um, client um, or, the property owner to uh, to manage as long as we're compliant with parking. And I just want to state that we are, again, compliant with the city's parking requirements. In fact, we exceed them. And we believe that we can successfully manage that on this site. And Max is w welcome to say anything more on that that he'd like to say, but we've taken a very close look at it and we have treated it very seriously. Um, we believe that we are consistent with the master planning um, for housing near um, mass transit and whether the community wants to discount the nature of its adjacency to the S-Line or not, that does not uh, take away from the fact that we are in very close proximity to the S-Line and we believe that we are very consistent with master plans that have been um, out there in the community for quite a while um, that have uh, encouraged density and housing density and, uh, and, and less parking um, on projects that are near and adjacent to and close proximity to transit lines. Um, we also are very close to bus lines and to bike pathways um, that, uh, that also provide additional connectivity to the neighborhood. Um, and uh, another point that I want to make is someone stated that we don't have parking. That's just not correct. And I know they kind of corrected themselves, but we have um, ample parking for, we believe, for our project on site and uh, it will be managed by the um, of the project manager. Um, and then the community has asked uh, and mentioned uh, in both the community councils and again tonight that they would like a taller fence. We are working hard um, to be compliant with the city's goals for development and have been continually told not to request a taller fence. Um, that this fence that we are putting in is consistent with what the city would like to see. And we are working hard to balance both those things, both the community's interests and the desire um, to be compliant with the city's goals for development. And um, so we are working to provide denser landscaping along the South property line as a, as a compromise for that um, and believe that we are consistent in doing so with the conversation during the last community council meeting or planning commission meeting that we attended. Um, so Max, unless you have any further comment, um, I'll wrap it up with that. OK. 
Ken. Thank you. Yep. Does the commission have any uh, questions for the applicant or for um, staff or uh, any comments regarding this, this proposal? I would like to point out to all of the people who are uh, here to visit uh, with the commission and testify before the commission uh, that what is at, uh, what is being discussed here are design review uh, elements and a special exception to allow three feet of additional building height elements. Um, the applicant is correct that the parking meets the zoning standards and so parking is not at issue here. So are there other um, are there other comments? I mean, I think feel for the neighborhood and kind of their perspective. Um, you know, I was really concerned about the homes along the back and rear of this project the last time this was before us and really put uh, to make sure that there was some mitigation towards what the impact is on behind those homes. And looking at the standards, I mean, the only parking standard that really applies in the design review section is number H, which just talks about on-site circulation and connections to sidewalks, transit facilities, and mid-block crossways. And unfortunately, I mean, the number of units, the number of parking stalls, or how they're managing it, whether it's paid or unpaid, is really outside our purview. So it's not a place that we can make a, a thing around, um, a decision around. So, you know, I, I was a big voice. Um, when that's probably before about making sure we mitigate that rear and I think they've you know probably done what they could to meet the kind of standards that are laid out in the design standards and so I guess I'm generally supportive at this point in time based on the standards we have before us uh, for the project. I agree with Matt. I think they've, they've addressed the concerns that we set forth. Not everything about the development is before us today. Um, and given the modifications they made to the plan, I'm comfortable moving forward. I, I, I do want to respond. I mean, I do feel, you know, that we, I do, I do sympathize with, with some of the comments about feeling the pressures of development in, in these neighborhoods, but I, I do also think that, you know, this body does work very hard to try to listen to concerns and accommodate what we can uh, from the neighborhood and reflect what communities are there, but also, you know, respect the, the property rights and developing rights and the zoning uh, overlays that are there. So I probably I do disagree with some of the, at least one of the comments from the public that mentioned that we uh, don't don't try to do that because I do think we've worked very hard. Um, and particularly the way we've addressed this project in the last meeting was one one which we you know shows that we, we we are trying to accommodate these within the standards that are before us. Any additional comments? From the commission, do I have a? Um, would anyone like to make a motion? We'll make a motion. Okay. It's based on the information and the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve petition numbers PLN CCM 2020-00222 and PLN PCM 2020-00655, the design review and special exception request, respectively, for Izzy South, located at approximately 534 East 2100 South, with the conditions listed in the staff report. Thank you. I have a motion by Adrian. Second. Was that John? Yes. Okay, thank you, John. I have a motion by Adrian and a second by John. Uh, we'll now go to a roll call vote. Maureen? Yes. Amy? Uh, yeah, I just want to make a quick comment to the commenters that we do, you know, we do read your comments, we do listen, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Lyon that we do try and address the things that are actually under our purview. Um, we legally cannot require an applicant to provide more parking than the code. I've said that in other meetings. The code is set by the city council. If you feel the code is inadequate, you have a city council member that you should get to know and, and start working with them. But as what's before us tonight, um, I will say yes. Adrian? Yes. 
Carolyn? Agree, yes. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Andres? I don't feel I know enough about this project to be able to approve it, so I will vote no. Sarah? Is Sarah still with us? Hello? Yes. We can hear you, Sarah. Okay. Is that it? Yes, it's my vote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have seven in favor, one opposed, and it uh, passes. Thank you all very much for your participation. Um, so we'll move on to our next project. Uh, but I am. Um, um, do we not have minutes from our last meeting? We we do not at the moment because of the holiday and Marlene was off. And so okay. we will have those meetings at the next planning commission meeting next week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to uh, our second project, the COZO House Design Review at approximately 157, 175 North, 600 West, and 613, 621, 625, 633, West 200 North. Uh, the project is going to be presented by Caitlin Miller. Oh, sorry, numbers are case number PLN PCM 2020-00258. It was tabled from a 1014 planning commission meeting. Go ahead, Caitlin. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the introduction. So as the chair said, this item is um, located at approximately 600 West and 200 North in these parcels that are outlined in orange. It is located in the TSA UCT zoning district, and it was under consideration by the Planning Commission on October 14, 2020. This application came before the Planning Commission as a design review because the applicant is requesting approval for a building that has a facade length that is greater than 200 feet in length. And that is why they are here this evening. The item was tabled um, by the Planning Commission um, following discussion about the location of the break in the building. The Planning Commission suggested that that break be relocated closer to the intersection of the street so it is uh, more visible and uh, more viable for people um, as they're walking up and down 600 West. The Planning Commission also recommended some additional treatment of the building at the intersection in order to facilitate more pedestrian usage and then a greater ground floor retail area articulation. The, um, Planning Commission at the October meeting felt that there was a large amount of, uh, of glass and it was just a, a curtain wall of glass. So the Planning Commission recommended some additional architectural materials there to break up that level. So since that meeting in October, the project itself has undergone a few changes following some further research done by the applicants. Uh, seven units have been added, so instead of the original 312 units that were requested in October, they are requesting, um, well, not requesting, but the, the project includes 319 units now. Uh, the lower level of parking has been removed, so there is only one level of structured parking, and uh, 10 parking stalls have also been removed from that. So the applicant is utilizing the city lift system to stack vehicles within the parking garage. And the project requires 109 parking stalls. When the project originally came before the Planning Commission in October, they were providing 141 stalls. They are now providing 131 stalls. So this requirement is still being met. However, there has been a parking reduction. The applicant has also added a corner plaza with some seating and fireplaces at the intersection of 600 West and 200 North to accommodate some of the Planning Commission's feedback. 
And additionally, the second drive access has been removed. So there is no longer parking access from 600 West. All of the access for all 131 stalls is now located off of 200 North. So those are some of the project changes that have occurred since the last meeting. As you can see, here is the original um, concept plan. Uh, as you can see, there are two, still the two drive accesses and the break in the building is located farther to the west, almost immediately adjacent to that drive access on 200 North. Here is the updated concept plan. So you still have that drive access on 200 North. However, the break in the building and those amphitheater-like steps have been relocated about uh, 40 feet farther to the, to the east. Again, um, this is the original parking plan. So the parking, the ground level parking was accessed off of 200 North here. And then there was a secondary lower level of parking that was accessed off of 600 West here. That access on 600 West has been removed. And then all of these patched stalls here are utilizing the city lift system, which the planning commission has seen before. This is a rendering of the original um, Kozo House building where you can see that there is still a retail usage at the corner or the intersection um, point of the building here. That has since been removed and there is a sunken in open area with some seating and a fireplace which is intended to be utilized by the retail tenants and their customers as well as you know, um, pedestrians walking by, perhaps on the way to the train, um, deciding to stop and grab a cup of coffee, things like that. And then in the bottom right image here, that also just shows how the applicant has incorporated some additional architectural materials to break up that glass curtain wall on the ground floor. This is the end of staff's presentation. I'm happy to take any questions if you have them, or I will turn the time over to our applicants. Thank you. Are there any you. clarifications needed from staff? If not, we will go ahead and move on to the applicant. Hello, uh, it's Dal and Jolly here with David Clayton, the architect. Um, we have a little presentation if we can share that now. You have to pass here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you guys see that okay? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's, it's um, screen. Okay, so we, uh, as, as Caitlin had mentioned, we were at the Planning Commission on October 14th, um, asking for some design uh, review uh, for the facade length. Um, and we will address both the, both the facade length, uh, the articulation and the ground floor retail and otherwise. Um, okay, next. So the, the planning, uh, the, com the comments from the planning commission that we had taken last time were the architectural facade break building was too far west on the dead end and should be moved closer to the corner of 600 west for more engagement from the public, the public slash neighborhood. Second comment that we took was break up the ground floor glazing and, and introduce more materials, a better way finding an articulation on the retail facing elements on the ground floor of both 600 west and 200 north. Another comment was to create more activated corner on 600 West and 200 North uh, for better applied public use. Another comment was to create more articulation in the building's facade to achieve a look that is more multifamily and less office looking. And one was uh, to create more available parking. So I will address those uh, comments as we move forward here. Um, as Caitlin uh, showed in, in one of those images, the, uh, the architectural break, we had moved it closer, uh, 42 feet closer to the corner. That was a comment that I think Amy had, had originally uh, requested is that the break was too far down on the dead end street and to move that a little bit closer to the corner so it, it serves the public a little bit better being a public space. 
Um, so we did this while still being able to achieve and meet the zoning code that is 200 feet um, in the facade length on both of those sections. So that's what we had introduced was we felt like it meets the code and it also uh, pulls that, that break a little bit closer for articulation purposes. There's uh, some updated renderings that show uh, the location of the break um, that were not included in the staff report and also the articulation of the retail right on these comments will focus on that articulation being moved forward slightly. Okay. Um, this shows uh, just a, a closer up image of that break um, and how the uh, uh, ground floor retail is activated through that space. This again shows um, an overhead view of the where that basically where the dead end street is looking out to show where how that break had been again moved closer to the corner of 600 West. The second comment was to break up the ground floor glazing and introduce more materials that are wayfinding and articulation on the retail facing elements on the ground floor on both 600 West and 200 North. Our resolution to this was removed glazing on the corner to open it up, which we'll go over uh, in, in, in just a minute. We added defined entrances to the commercial spaces with the use of vestibules clad in oak to continue the design language of the above residences and French doors for access. We added mullions to the top of the glazing and then also landscaped boxes to the bottom. Wayfinding and signage would be accomplished by uh, blade. It's kind of blade signage that actually protrudes out. So it, it, it creates uh, more of a visual interest as you're walking down the street. Um, if you're on the corner, you can see uh, wayfinding to those uh, commercial accesses. Um, and then we also uh, have a large metal canopy that we introduced um, yeah, like a gabled canopy on the corner that introduces a little bit more depth uh, for the building. But I wanted to just point out in this specifically on 200 North, there was a mass of glazing. So we really did try to do our best to remove the glazing and then actually separate uh, the glazing up quite a bit by adding those, those wooden vestibules and also some landscape boxes while adding um, some architectural protrusion from the concrete that allows those spaces to be a little bit more well-defined along 200 North. And then also this is on the 600 west side. Uh, so this would be looking at the very south portion of the building, walking up. Uh, there used to be an entrance to a garage on 600 west um, that had now become a, a restaurant. We had a restaurant that was a lower level that got removed. That was a tavern. It was a concern that one of the, the comments brought up and, and we listened to that and, and are just gonna do a more nighttime restaurant in that space. Um, and this shows, um, you know, it, this is just an architectural kind of rendering of like some some signage for the for the address is 175, but that's still up for kind of discussion and debate. Um, but as far as the the two retail spaces on the front, instead of just having a massive glazing, we wanted to break it up with that signage of the address and then uh, define the two retail spaces in the front to have their own separate entrances. This uh, is taking a look. This is on 200 North side, uh, looking at this space here, how it kind of articulates through that break and the amphitheater style seating that also engages into what we would be imagining as a coffee shop in that location that has some outdoor seating in the uh, park strip and um, kind of articulates around, but again, showing how that, that break of, of the glazing happens uh, in and it kind of um, it joins up to the the break that was created. This is another view of that to show where the break is located in the building and how the wayfinding helps identify those spaces and how it articulates through the space. This is a rendering of that corner that we had talked about. I, one of the main comments was, um, actually, if you go down one more slide, I think I mentioned it. So the comment was to create more activated, um, a more activated corner on 600 West and 200 North for better applied public use. Um, our response was to design an outdoor living room on the corner to be used as public access for dining, gathering, working in coordination with all the commercial tenants and patrons. Um, what's that? And the uh, public art. Oh, and, 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 and use of public art on that back wall. But what we really wanted to do is break up the mass of glazing that was happening. There is a requirement of glazing and a requirement of retail that's happening, but we thought that it would be a more appropriate use for the space to allow the neighborhood and the rest of the community to actually access that corner instead of just having it be a massive glazing. We reduced our retail quite a bit for this, but we think it's a good use of public space. It's a it's kind of a mixed use of public space for all the commercial patrons and the neighbors to 
to gather and to actually be out of the elements and be kind of covered, but have some outdoor activated space. You can go one more down. Uh, here's another view. So this is actually on that corner if you were to be on the sidewalk to show how those blade signs show up on both sides. Where it says COZO, that would be the entrance to for the residents. And then uh, this corner, if you go one more down as well, this corner shows how that outdoor living room would actually extend into what would be that commercial space. We're imagining a deli or some sort of bodega on that side that would use this space for residences, uh, commercial patrons and otherwise. And then you can see that gabled um, uh, architectural element, that canopy on the front to help give a little bit more depth on the corner to, to draw into that space. One of the comments also was to create more articulation in the building's facade to achieve a look that is more that is more multifamily, quote unquote, and less office, quote unquote. The resolution was to we before we had just a mass of, of those bevels with the wooden insets and glass balconies, um, which which there was a comment that made it feel very officey. What we wanted to do is, is address that by adding um, the a section of the building within two pattern that allowed that that the window to be flush and then added a black cladding um, in between those vertical protrusions to allow some a little bit of variation and articulation in the design language um, there and then also as i mentioned that it used to be glass railings which feels a little bit more commercial and we wanted to introduce a more uh, kind of stamped metal black metal railing that's it feels a little bit more appropriate for the multi-family aspect of the building uh, again, it just shows the um, the variation of those of the articulation there, and it shows again the retail space. We added a couple really small boutique kind of retail spaces, even though it's on the dead end core of that of, of 200 North. Uh, we wanted those retail spaces to be able to be used uh, potentially by kind of as live workspaces for the residents above to have smaller, more affordable retail spaces. And so instead of having one mass of glazing, as, as was mentioned, we, we really thought about breaking those spaces into smaller retail spaces to engage the community and have a little bit more retail tenancy that was appropriate. This also shows the break in the building there. Um, one other thing that was, was, a, was huge comments from the public was, was parking. It's something that we're not able to absolutely address and, and there's going to be many more comments i'm sure on parking in the neighborhood what we did is we went we went to to caitlin and the rest of the transportation department and engineering and we requested to be able to have a study done uh, that we did at our expense on the uh, civil engineering side to see if we could allow more parking on the street and the parking strip uh on both sides of the building are massive um and we thought that it would be a good idea to to use those for parking so we could isolate the parking closer to our development instead of having it be widespread throughout throughout the neighborhood that was one of the comments so this was something that we had uh, come up with originally we were we were wanting to add 37 stalls that was uh, more isolated on the property the one on 200 north would just be painted lines because there was there's there's a big pushback with engineering city engineering and transportation of actually using and the park forestry. Strip and urban forestry to keep the park strips maintained so on 200 north there's the streets are actually really wide and so we were able to do that without um protruding into the park strips we then suggested but on 600 west to actually protrude into the park strip and uh put diagonal parking urban forestry and i think transportation didn't totally love that idea um and there was there was some issues with that but that is something that we are interested in doing if if at all possible to to add parking there um and that was the comment on that i think the last slide is just our another kind of updated rendering of showing that corner showing that that break in the building um and on on both the ground floor level and also the articulation of the facade break and some of the retail so that is my presentation and i'll turn it back over to you guys thanks very much thank you okay are there any questions or clarifications for the applicant from the commission I do have a um, question for the applicant. Go ahead. Um, was there a change in the number of units from your previous presentation in October to now? I, I couldn't um, catch that. Yeah, there, the, the previous was 312 and, it, and it's uh, now 319. 
Okay, and the, the number of parkings went down by 10, is that, is that correct? Yeah, there's 132 stalls, and I can address that really quickly. We, after doing a deep dive into our engineering study and our geotech study, the groundwater at this site is five feet deep. And we had wanted to use um, underground, an entire underground level of parking, and it's just not feasible. There's, there's no way, uh, construction-wise, that we, that we can do it. It would be constant water mitigation, and it would be, it would, it's just not possible to go, to go a full story down. We have, we'd have to go 14 feet down, and we'd basically be in a tub, um, which makes the project uh, infeasible. So we decided that we, we, uh, because of that, we had to reinvest into the city lift system to be able to get our parking to try to get it exactly where we had it before. Uh, before it was at 142, but with the city lift system that we're now investing over two and a half million dollars to to complete, um, we were able to get our parking pretty close to where we were at 132 instead of 141. And then we also then we also wanted to address parking with uh, potential to have this 37 additional stalls on street parking available on the site. So that's a little bit of background on it. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open the public meeting. Uh, for the public, and I just want to reiterate that uh, this is a uh, design review uh, of this project. Uh, it does follow the parking guidelines uh, for the city zoning requirements. So that is not at issue here. Um, and also I want to say that we have received uh, several uh, extremely interesting and, ve and well-worded um, comments in our packet that were given to you. We were given, we were given in advance. So um, those, are, um, those are being under consideration. So um, uh, with that, I'll just open up the public hearing. Are there anyone who'd like to speak? We do have a number of people. Um, I'm gonna start with Pamela Starley. I'm Pamela? sorry, do we have anybody from the community council before we? Uh, I don't see a name I recognize, but if somebody wants to indicate that they are, um, then we will certainly acknowledge that and give more, more time. Um, if you if you uh, if you are a member of the public, you will have two minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Thank you. Okay. I apologize that my comments don't seem very polished, but so, um, can you give your name, please? Yes. This is Pamela Starley, and um, I'm going to hurry through this. I've tried to type it up, but didn't have much time. So I hate the feeling that I'm such a little person in the world, that my opinion and the opinions of other people cannot make a difference, that we can't be heard or listened to. Mr. Lyon said a few minutes ago that you do try to work on things, but the end of those public comments on the Izzy project were the developer saying he just didn't agree and didn't care, and he simply thinks that the parking's adequate. And it seems so often that different committees or agencies cite reasons why their hands are tied, such as zoning allowances that enable a developer to build in maximum parameters or requirements. I know that changing those things require efforts in other directions, but the person whose hands are least tied seems to be the developer himself. His hands are not so tied. Within the height and breadth and depth of space given him, he can do what he wants to. But just because he can do something doesn't mean he should do it and that it's the right or the best thing. And so while I'm a little bit confused about the procedures of things, my comments are mostly directed to Dal and Jolly. Mr. Jolly, I know you received at least three letters from neighbors here. One of them was mine. I was not rude or strident. I politely asked you to consider reducing the building height and gave you reasons why I creatively suggested a method for increasing parking and solving some car problems, citing something that was done elsewhere. I never got a reply from you. Did you reply to any of us? You have even reduced the parking and increased the units. Amazing. 
certainly didn't consider just eliminating an entire floor. Did you seriously consider our concerns, objections, and suggestions? Through your website and some interactions with others, you fancy yourself an approachable, caring man and your partner, yet did you even read our letters? Why have you not modified your idea much in those directions, except for tweaking the facade of this building, a building that created some outcry? I'd like to hear your answers to those questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will ask the developer to address those issues following the public hearing. Next up, we have um, Kiko Jones. Yes. Hi, my name is Keiko, and Keiko. I can repeat everything Pamela said and also the public comments from the previous discussion about Easy South. Um, just because you are allowed to do something doesn't mean you should not consider your moral obligation. And parking is a big issue. I feel like TSA zone just failed because everywhere we follow the tracks, there are parking issues. And I'm another one of the um, three uh, who wrote the email to the developer and I never heard back. And it's amazing in the last meeting on October 14th, we voiced our concerns about parking and the height. And so the developer increased the units and decreased parking stalls. That's just amazing. And also according to the North Temple master plan, um, we should be having a transitional zone between you know, um, re uh, residential and a TSA, but this is just boom, just next to, you know, um, single family homes, um, six story building that doesn't allow any kind of transition. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Who's, who's next? Hi, I'm Shalene Fortier, and I, I've got some comments. This is obviously aimed at the developer. I'm along, I'm a neighbor there on 600 West. Um, I'm the one who probably noticed this the first about this and alerted all of our neighbors. So this is some good news, bad news, and this is mostly directed at the developer. Dallin, I think that you took the Planning Commission's feedback in regards to the architecture, the overall look and feel, the reducing the 200 feet and um, adding some of the public space so it livens it up and it makes it look much cleaner and nicer. So good job on that. However, my concern um, and I'm going to echo this again and again, regardless of what um, Madam Chairman has, Chairwoman has said about the parking issue, is that it seemed that you did adhere to what they said. You provided excellent feedback to their redesign um, feedback. But it's like the neighbors just don't have even, it's like the neighbors are a pesky fly that you're trying to swat in regards to the parking. The traffic between North Temple and 200 North is crazy right now. It doesn't matter how many spaces that you put in on the side of the street, the neighborhood will still feel the impact of your building. And that is extremely disappointing to hear that you have presented yourself as this kind of from the neighborhood, kind of a guy you've lived here. And if that were any, anywhere near true, I think you would have realized the importance of having, keeping the neighborhood as intact as possible without impacting the neighborhood, like what you were proposing to do with this development. And I'm sad and I'm disappointed that we didn't have strong enough of a voice, even to the effect that you decided to decrease the amount of parking that you had. Um, so I wish that you could have done better. I wish that you had responded to our emails. I wish that you had responded to everything. My next 
comment is directed at the planning commission and perhaps someone can tell me the correct person to talk to because what I understand from the previous October meeting is that any change to the TSA zoning is left to the city council. However, my comments to Chris Wharton came back to me as that any changes to the to the zoning is resting rest solely on the planning commission's shoulders. So it seems like there's a little bit of like one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. I just would like a firm answer so that any issues going forward, any questions that we have about parking and zoning to that effect can be answered by one singular agency instead of multiple agencies distributing Thanks. and pushing us off. Thank you, Shannon. Your time is up, and we will we will answer your question as soon as the public hearing is over. Next up, we have Antonio Bibi. Antonio, you're uh, unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? We yes. can. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Antonio Fierro. I'm with the Rose Park Brown Berets. I was at the last meeting about this. And so this is directly towards the uh, developers and the planning commission. So to Dallin Jolly and David Kinn, you know, what the, what you are doing to this neighborhood is, is harmful. Um, this is exactly what gentrification is. Dallin, you said that you moved into the Guadalupe neighborhood four years ago, and you said that you cared about it. But by demolishing seven houses that people are currently living in, shows you that you don't care at all. You said that these homes are in bad condition is not true. You are just using that as an excuse to make a profit. And because you have the money to upgrade and fix these homes for families in the neighborhood. You directly said that you would do your best to make this affordable, but they are not affordable at all. 70% AMI is not affordable. That's only affordable to families that make $60,000 a year versus a family that makes $18,000 a year or $20,000 a year, which is, which is BS of what you are telling us. So you kept using that 70% AMI as an excuse. So, so planning commission, you also said that you cannot do anything about this, but you can because you guys are being bystanders. If you guys are not speaking for the people, you work for us. Okay, so please oppose the causal apartments. It does not fit in the neighborhood. It is racist. It is classist. Please stop it. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. All right, next up we have um, Icona, who indicated at the last item she wanted to speak on this as well. Icona? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is directed to the um, uh, planning committee and to also the um, developers. Malolele, um, Talofalava, I greet you from Samoa and Tonga, the people that live and um, when <laughs> Buenos noches and um, all the other languages that uh, you developers and um, commission have not taken the time to get to know. When you come into a neighborhood, there's a difference between development and neighborhood. When you come into a neighborhood, you come and speak to the neighbors. You come in and bring a, a, a dish, a casserole, some tamales, some food. You come and break bread with them. You do not, absolutely not come during the holidays at a secret time and buy people out. You do not make promises. And um, this is also to you, Caitlin Miller. Um, many people have tried to call you, but your phone, you're, you're not accessible. Um, and please commission, when, when you say to us, um, yes, uh, we will have the developers answer afterwards, please do have them and have them answer these questions. Why are they not answering these questions? Do not be bought out by money. And to you, Mr. David Clayton, you look like a young gentleman who, please go and have some experiences in life to, to know and get to know people that do not, cannot afford, nor do we want to live in a place like that. Get to know the neighborhood and stop um, um, gentrifying this neighborhood. Gentrification is violence. And at a time of COVID-19, when people are dying left and right in our neighborhoods, brown and black people, know what you are coming to and stop sitting back uh, planning commission because there are people young people rising up and if you will not do it we will do it so you are in there to serve the people not serve the developers there are the people's lives 
are much more because you serve someone if you have you, you um if you have a faith or religion there's someone higher than that dollar that you're being promised underneath the table and for the love of the children and the love of the land do not adhere and be have your souls be sold for just a dollar or just owe that house do not do that on on our behalf and if you do that please do not have that job let someone else come into the position that is going to protect our community and build our community and not tear from it so thank i'm you. asking you thank you very thank much you. At, thank you thank you very much i'm sorry we're out of you're out of time so are there others who wish to speak? we have um one new call-in user that i'm going to to unmute and see if that person wants to speak. I don't believe they have the ability to raise their hand. So, uh, and unfortunately I can't see the number. Oh, sorry. Um, call in user four, I've unmuted you. Can you, can you uh, speak? Do you want to speak on this? Hello? Yeah. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. Um, thank you. Yes, I would love to speak um, uh, of uh, the situation that's going on. Um, I know that um, Rose Park is a really heavy uh, Samoan populated uh, community. I'm Samoan, and um, I I've seen the community grow like uh, tremendously over there in that neighborhood. And not only just the Psalm one, but also like you have our African American brothers and sisters, and you have um, our Latinx brothers and sisters as well, and other folks as well. Um, at this point, like when I've gone to see like the marketing of the housing, and my goodness, it's out of control. There's no way to figure out all these sellers, these cash buyers who are buying these lands in, in Rose Park, but not being able to to go and um, to see how, how like it, it's hard for a lot of us out here, but I just wanted to say that uh, that that please do not build this uh, um, uh, in our community. I mean, just for the love of our, of our community, we just ask that you just think about the people, think about the community, and also just think about the children, the ones that you'll you will affect all over in the city. So thank you very much. Thank you. So is that uh, it, Nick, or? And we have a couple more hands that have come up. Next up okay. is Jason Walker. Uh, yes, I'd like to first thank the Planning Commission for all the hard work they do. Um, again, my name is Jason Walker. I live in the neighborhood. I've been here for over 20 years. I first sort of have a question to the Planning Commission and then a comment. My question is, these units are referred to as multifamily, but over 90% of them are uh, 378 square feet. So I'm somewhat confused why they're referred to as multifamily. Could you clarify that? Uh, they are, excuse me, they are multifamily because they are more than one unit in a building. Uh, I see. Okay, I thought it might have been, you know, they're vastly studio apartments. Okay, um, and again, my understanding is that you could only talk about the articulation of the fa facade, that you can't really, your hands are tied when it comes to parking. Um, that's correct? Uh, we've already addressed that, but we have already addressed that in the sense that they meet all the requirements for the master plan. So if we had a thousand comments or even a hundred thousand comments dealing with the effect of the neighborhood, since they've met the requirements of the master plan, the comments are therefore mostly meaningless. Is that correct? I would not characterize it that way, but we could discuss it after the public hearing. Well, it seems like they are meaningless. Okay, to then went on to my comment. To have such a large apartment building with such small apartments is just bold-faced avarice. It is capitalism insensate. I cannot believe that this is happening throughout the city. And 20 years from now, when these places begin to fall apart 
and the population of the city might not be what we project it to be, just like those pipelines done in the 1980s, supposedly to drain the Great Salt Lake, we spent $65 million and they're useless. The, basically, we'll have problems in the future. It's just, it's just the whole process has been very, very sad. But I do commend you on all the hard work you guys have put in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Uh, I am not seeing that anybody else has raised their hand that hasn't already spoken. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and open it back up to the commission. But first, I would like to give the applicant a chance to respond to the comments, and I would particularly direct your attention to responding to specific questions that were asked of you. Yeah, I, I, I can, I, you know, I could spend way too long trying to address every single comment. A lot of the comments I, I had addressed was, was done in the last planning commission. Um, I appreciate all the comments and, and I am sensitive to them. Um, we have, you know, really thought about this neighborhood and I, and I have lived in this neighborhood for a, for a number of time, uh, over four years. And what we were trying to do and what I thought the area really needed was to add affordable units and add affordable housing units to this neighborhood. This is downtown core neighborhood and it's a supportive neighborhood. That's what the TSA UCT zone does is it supports residents and tenants that are transit oriented. And we want to do that with an affordable rate unit that also allows them to, um, to use the transit appropriately. And that's what this building was designed to do. The density that's there is designed to accommodate that. It's a, it's a common, the, the density allows us to have affordability. So I hear the comments, but we are building this building in a coordination, in accordance with the master plan of the city. We are not asking for additional building height. We're not asking for uh, any exceptions to parking. We are not asking for any setback reductions. All we were asking for is to make sure the articulation of the architecture meets well with the neighborhood and that it is well represented and that we will be adding really fabulous tenants to the neighbors to the neighborhood. I have many, many, many people that I've chatted with the neighbor in the neighborhood and I've tried my best to communicate with a lot of these people and address to address some of the letters that I've received. There was not a lot that I could have said to answer all of their questions. I got um, I got a, a few letters that were well thought out and well delivered, but they were questions that I had already had um, I had already addressed whether in my comments previously or directly with the individuals. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we focused on the planning commissioner's comments and we feel like we've addressed those to make the building a better building for the neighborhood. We do think that we are providing adequate uh, articulation and, and, and the design review itself should be approved based on the fact that we listened to the planning commission's comments and that we're doing everything that we can to, do a, to build a really great building here. One of the comments addressed the homes. We currently own all seven of those homes and five out of the seven are unrentable because of, because of methamphetamine use and, and or uh, poor conditions. They are not you know, thriving families that are living there. It's a dilapidated uh, section of the block and it needs to, they need to be removed either way. Um, and we think that this is the best use to be able to have some affordable units and comfort. David, can I interject? Um, what houses are those on Second North that you own? Yep, Second North and, and then on on the corner. I'd have to go back and see exactly which ones have been um, dilapidated and are are unrentable. But there's seven, and I think f three, four, or five of them are unrentable, as as what the property manager is telling us. Unless we go through major remediation and uh, renovation. So, are, are you saying that you own all of the single family homes? on the south side of second north um across the street from this project that's correct okay okay so uh can you explain a little um a little bit you said it but i would like you to clarify it a little bit how higher density makes it more affordable 
Yeah, so j just based on a pro forma rate, so we could have luxury units that rent for quite a bit more that are larger square footage. Um, but what that really does add to gentrification, and, and I hear those comments, but putting units in here that are larger square footage and that rent for you know, two to twenty-five to three thousand dollars a month. That has a, a vast impact on the neighborhood, much more than the smaller affordable units that meet the master plan of the zone, which is to have um, affordable units, and that's also a transit-oriented tenant. So that's that was that was our whole goal is to have workforce and affordable housing here, and we're able to do that by a density um, to get the density up, basically, to get there instead of having large luxury units. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the commission? I would also like to see if um, if um, Nick can address the issue that was asked by the one of the um, people about how a zoning change happens. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to do that, um, and I'm I'm apologize for any sort of um, miscommunication or or errors, frankly in that but basically under state law a zoning change um, has to go through the planning commission first for a recommendation and then ultimately to the city council for a decision um, and that's the simplest way to put it in salt lake there's uh, a certain early engagement period that's required as part of that that happens before the planning commission process uh, but that's that's basically it. So, so the ultimate decision maker on zoning is the city council. The planning commission actually doesn't have the authority to um, change zoning um, at their level. They can only make recommendations. And, and Nick, will you um, elaborate on the role that the planning commission does not have in initiating um, zoning uh, language changes as well? Um, yeah, so under the... The city code authorizes um, the initiation of a zoning change in three different, well, I'm, in several different ways. Um, first is that a property owner or um, can submit a, a an amendment of an application to change the zoning. The mayor can initiate that process to start a zoning amendment. The city council can initiate that process and actually the planning commission does have the authority to initiate a yes, um, zoning amendment process yes, we do. but but i want to also clarify that we do not we cannot change the zoning on a project that's already in the process that that's correct if there's a, a process that the zoning ordinance authorizes and somebody submits an application and it's a complete application under both well, state under state law, they are um, what what's called an entitled to that process. So they have a right to the process and the regulations that are in place at the time their application is a complete application is submitted. So even if the planning commission wanted to change the zoning on this particular site or to recommend that it be changed we could not no one could really do that at this point not even the city council is that correct uh yeah that that's basically can basically correct um yeah right. okay thank you i just wanted to clarify that so that everyone who was listening in understands uh, that is, as someone put it, our hands are tied. So um, are there any other questions or comments um, from the Planning Commission? I've got a question for the applicant. Um, you've used the word affordable a number of times. When you, are you saying affordable as in they are at or below, you know, based on the, the AMI, or is it affordable because you just have more units? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're so you're running to the market rate or the actual affordable units. Right. Yeah, we're we're targeting targeting a sixty eight percent AMI for the studio. Yep. Um, and then a second question for you, um, I guess really for I guess for planning staff actually, one of the app, uh, public comments brought up the issue about a, the transition zone uh, coming from the, and I'm just wondering how this kind of fits in the transition zone. If you could kind of answer to that. 
for staff. Absolutely. So this is in uh, the TSA zone, and the TSA zone is broken up into a, cr a core area and a transition area. So the core area allows for um, taller buildings, whereas the transition area allows for, um, you know, still fairly tall buildings, although not quite as tall as the core. And this zone is intended to serve as a transition between the uh, the more high rise, um, high intensity urban core um, transit area developments um, and the single family and, and two family residential zones around it. What is the height restriction of the core areas? I believe the core is 80 feet, but let me confirm that. And the height restriction to this, this area is 60 feet, is that correct? That is correct, yes. And there's a note, a staff report that says this building is actually 67 feet. I'm just trying to better understand how that is there. I mean, that's on page 90. Mm -hmm. So, the so seven and a half feet or 67 feet and one eighth inch. Yep, 67 feet and, and change. So the reason for that is that the applicants in conjunction with their design review application also submitted for a TSA score. And um, in the TSA score application, if a project scores high enough, it qualifies for um, staff level approval. And um, if it's another bonus for it, if it scores um, this highly is that they're entitled to an additional habitable story. So this project did score highly enough to qualify for the staff level approval and they did qualify for that additional story. However, it is still coming before the planning commission because they are requesting that oh, design wow. because the, the facade along 200 north is more than 200 feet long. And can you maybe just articulate for those in the um the, the public just what are, what are some of those items that go into the, those scores and why why did this building score so highly so some of the items that go into the score are the number of parking stalls um, sustainable utility infrastructure um, whether or not the um, the site utilizes um, sustainable building materials so on and so forth so this project is incorporating a rather large array of sustainable utility infrastructure. Um, the entire roof essentially is a solar garden. So that did um, significantly pad the score of the project in that TSA review. Particularly it's green sort of score. Did it get points for its uh, affordable housing kind of aspects or get points for, uh, you know, other, other amenities that would be tied into the neighborhood or no? So at the point that the TSA score was um, conducted and researched, there was um, there was not the same level of uh, pricing study that there is now. So the affordability of the units was not taken into consideration at that point. Okay. Um, and then just for the, for the applicant, um, I mean, one of the standards that we're looking at in this is number D, and it just says large building masses have been divided into heights and sizes related to human scale. And then uh, the main one, under number one, D1, says relate building scale to massing and size and scale of the existing and anticipated buildings to kind of run the neighboring areas. You know, I do recognize that just right across the street from you is the neighborhood is SR1. Um, I'm trying to actually pull the height what's on those areas, but maybe you just talk to me real quick on how you, you tried to mass this building in ways that would relate to the people across the street, across 200 North. For the applicants, if you can answer that. Yeah, yeah, I, happy, happy to answer. So I think some context of the neighborhood is appropriate as well. We're just right off of North Temple, which is a majority of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, six story developments that is happening on North Temple. This, uh, the, the apartment building right directly to the south of us, I think is, is about 
45 or 50 feet. So it's not completely out of whack for the neighborhood. There's also the Boys and Girls Club, which was just uh, completed directly south of us as a commercial use. There is, um, I think it's a senior living directly across the street um, that is probably 40 feet tall. There's a couple duplexes and triplexes across the street on 600 West Side, where this camera angle, if you can still see, is basically in front of is, is that, uh, multi, that multifamily, I think it's senior living. Um, but this is a transition course. So it does transition from all these areas from 200 North down to North Temple is the transition area. And then there's the core area from North Temple all the way down into the gateway mixed use area. There's a lot taller buildings. And I, and I think the TSA UCC is 90 feet and ours is, uh, ours is you know, 60 with an exception to, to go one story higher. Um, but there is there is um, scale that supports this project. This is a transition area and it's a, it's this is a, this is a new project and there's gonna be more projects like this in the future. So it it is a large project for this corner, but it is not completely out of whack for what is happening in the neighborhood and especially along the North Temple Transit Core area. Um, but it will it will continue to happen. This is you're you're quite literally two or three blocks from downtown core, and this is a supporting downtown core neighborhood. And that's why the master plan is is zoned this uh, this neighborhood as such. And now, if it was me, I, I totally sympathize and I agree. There should not be a SR one area directly across the street on 200 North. I think the reason it was permitted is because the link and the, the dimension from where the TSA UCT R zone to the neighbor is quite some distance. I'd have to do a measurement, but it's it's probably well over 150 to 200 feet to those uh, SR one zones, and it's the only area, but it's not directly uh, neighboring any of the zones, all the neighboring zones on our side of the block are TSA UCT. So it's not out of whack for our for our core block. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Right. And can staff maybe help me, I mean, I'm trying to look it up real quick. What is the height limit on SR1A and SR3? I know those, yeah. I will pull those up real quick. I think SR1A is around 25 feet. It's a residential zone. It allows, you know, some different mix of uses with some multifamily duplexes and such, but it is a smaller residential zone. I think that what would be more appropriate is actually allow that transition to happen to where it would be, you know, an RMF 30 or an RMF 35 on that side of the street to, to follow the master plan. But that would be, I think as of right now, SR1A is what it is. Yeah. With, with all due respect, we'll answer that question with the facts of what the code says. Thank you. Yep. All right. So I have the SR1 and SR1A zoning standards pulled up in front of me. So for buildings with pitched roofs, the maximum height in the SR1 zone is 28 feet and in the SR1A zone is 23 feet. For flat roofs, that is 20 feet in the SR1 zone and 16 feet in the SR1A zone. Thank you, Caitlin. Absolutely. So are there any additional questions for the applicant? Are there any other comments about this project? Yeah, I have um, one for Caitlin. Um, in, the, in the standards listed in H, parking and on-site circulation, your analysis wasn't updated for the new um, one entrance on Second North. Can you provide an updated um, analysis for why you think that it still complies, given now that we only have one parking garage entrance? I can. My apologies, I thought that table had been updated, but I will get a copy of that updated table over to the Planning Commission ASAP. Thanks. Um, I do want to just take a moment to the applicant and um, say that I think this building looks a lot better. And I do appreciate um, all of the stuff you've done. It, 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 and I think I said this the last time you were there. I thought you could do better. And I think that you went back and you did do better. So I appreciate those changes um, that you've made. And it really did address um, my concerns regarding that. I just now have this additional concern about some of this uh, vehicle circulation um, and related to the standard that I will read when Caitlin provides that. 
Um, I'm also wondering, I guess this goes to um, staff and applicant, uh, how do you work with transportation to um, perhaps institute certain uh, traffic measures on that intersection of 2nd North and, and 6 West given the load you're proposing to add to it? What are, what are the conversations you've had with transportation regarding that traffic flow or have you only talked to them about parking on street? This is a question for the applicant, Amy. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to hear if they, if the applicant, because they've mentioned they've talked with transportation. Have you discussed um, what type of measures that this load, this increased load, may um, present to that intersection? Because it's transportation that institutes all the traffic calming measures that we see in the city. Um, again, that is out of our purview, and, and I am definitely not a transportation engineer. But I want to know if you, as the applicant, have talked to them about that increased load. And then I guess when Caitlin provides her updated analysis on um, that standard, um, I might get an answer from staff on that. Um, I'm just concerned about that aspect of this redesign in terms of the traffic load. We're now putting on a dead end street. Yeah, I mean, I'll be the first to say I'm not a traffic expert as well. Um, we, we went and proposed, we had our, our civil engineer, uh, we had talked to our civil engineer and, and we talked about proposing the uh, diagonal parking on, on both sides of the, the uh, street to add more on street parking because of the width of the um, the width of the street. There was the uh, bicycle lane, I think was the was one of the primary concerns on 600 West. Um, that it would interrupt that. And so they had a concern of that on 600 West for the mm -hmm. diagonal parking. And then also urban forestry had some concern on, on cutting into the park strip. Um, as far as a full traffic study, I mean, I, I have not done that. And, and we have, we've talked to, uh, to transportation and engineering, but there has not been um, a full study done on what that would do. Um, other, other than us providing to transportation a recommendation of what we thought would be a little bit more appropriate to have some diagonal stalls that has not been approved, but it's something we we thought would be, we would recommend to them and they're still kind of deliberating. Caitlin was also in those conversations. So maybe she can speak to it a little bit more. David, if you have something you'd like to add. I, I do. And, and I just wanna, I just wanna reiterate, you know, add to that, that concerning traffic studies, I know that in some other localities, the cities actually do require uh, projects like this to um, to go through a traffic study. Salt Lake City at this time, to my knowledge, does not require traffic studies on projects like this. And if that's a concern for uh, for people, that's something they might want to take up with the city council. For, for our case, we have not been required to perform a traffic study. Uh, it is, um, so it's not something that we are engaged in. And and I guess we should also add 200 North. It is a dead end street, and so we don't suspect that there's going to be much of any traffic impact, other than like you said, Amy, at the intersection um, where those 132 cars in the parking garage plus any that are on the street may be going through there, but. Most likely they would be going through at different times of the day, but obviously I'm not a traffic engineer, I'm an architect, so I wanna be able to speak to that issue. I have a question okay. for the applicant. Go ahead, Carol. You reached out to the community regarding this project. So oh, we, we had a, a Zoom conversation with Chris Wharton, I think, who is the uh, community council chair or city council chair. Uh, we also talked to I've talked to a number of the neighbors, um, you know, previous to the first planning commission and also after um, we have we we actually have a meeting tomorrow night uh, with with community with one of the community council leaders. Um, we, we, we really have tried to engage as much as we can uh, with some with some of the community councils, but there hasn't been a whole bunch of, you know, discussion that's been had other than we talk about our project, we propose, they say thank you, and, and that's kind of that. And as far as the neighbors go, 
I've talked to a number of them. A lot of the neighbors uh, are supportive. The ones directly across the street on 200 North uh, are understandably not supportive because they're the ones most directly impacted both by parking and also uh, kind of visually on the street. But a lot of the, the neighbors and the community people that I know I've, I've had lunch with, I've talked to them, um, talked to them about the impacts of retail. I think a lot of them were actually really excited about the, uh, the addition of uh, all the different types of retail use and community use for the building. Um, and there wasn't a whole bunch of concern other than that. And they liked the aspect that it was a, you know, a building that adds value to the neighborhood. But um, I, I, I think that's the end of kind of the conversations I've had. Thank you. Planning commissioners, how would you like to proceed? Well, I'm just waiting to hear from Caitlin on an updated analysis for standard H. Um, based on this new design. So with that, um, the parking and on-site circulation is provided through that one singular access on 200 North. Um, from the, the planning's perspective, we do work with transportation from the get-go of these projects. Um, when they are submitted and we deem them complete, they are sent over um, to multiple city departments for their review. And we did receive some comments on um, transfer can into the record um, if the planning commission would like me to. These are from uh, Mr. Michael Berry. These were also included in your um, in your planning yeah, commission but are packet. These, Caitlin, are these based on the new proposal or are these based on the previous one? Because I'm interested in these are based on what's this proposal that's before us now, which is vastly different than sure. the previous. Sure. So these are based off of the original proposal. Um, the um, transportation division did indicate that egress from the parking structure does need to provide a 10 foot site distance to avoid pedestrian conflicts with the driveway. However, um, no additional concerns were brought up at the time of the original consideration. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not interested in holding this up anymore because I do think the applicant really did address the design concerns, but I think now what's before us is a vastly different project um, than before. So it's hard to just say, yeah, you did a good job with what we were concerned about before, because now we're reviewing a very different project. And I feel like I, I am interested in, in hearing more about what transportation's thoughts are on this new design in terms of standard age and the circulation with this increased load that is now solely directed um, on 200 North. I'm not saying it's a deal breaker, but I don't think that the, uh, and oftentimes I think the department review uh, from the other departments in the staff reports, I mean, they don't always even respond at all. So having transportation maybe understand um, a little bit better of what we would like, uh, what I would like so, to hear from them on is warranted for me. So I'm not, I'm not happy with um, passing this on without getting a better feedback from transportation on that specific question. So um, can I ask the applicant uh, to tell us uh, how many parking spaces were accessed originally on the two, from the 200 uh, north and how many are accessed now on, from the 200 north parking entrance? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that. On the uh, ground floor in the previous design, it was approximately 50 stalls. Um, through that north entrance and the basement was another 90 stalls. Um, so now what we've done is we've we've put it into the city lift parking stackers all on the one level, which means that we have 130 stalls going out through the one uh, the one garage entry on the north. So basically, 50. so basically, you know, not too far different from from the same loads. Almost two and a half times different. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I understand your math. She's you had one hundred and thirty versus fifty. 
Yes, as in like one of the garage entries on the basement was serving 90. Right. But now the, the I'm saying, saying that the 200 North entrance, instead of having 50 cars come in and out of there, you now have 130. Yes, but it's on a dead that's, end that's street. Two that and a half. That's two and a half. That's my math. Okay. 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 And so, so one of the one of the ways you can look at it is on 600 West. Um, we we've eliminated the traffic load there, other than what comes through the traffic circle at the intersection. So right. instead, the traffic is on a dead end street that has no traffic currently. Okay, commissioners, what is your pleasure? I need to have um, a motion for some action. So I am I'm in favor of tabling this to hear a better response from transportation. I feel like this was a um, a not great. Uh, you know, the, the applicant has been fine. I feel like that um, the staff report should have been updated and new responses from the city departments, given that this design is so different from what we previously heard. So that's where I'm at, but I would you know, want to do some sort of a hearing, listening to other commissioners, how they feel about that, um, because I think this is a big difference. And I don't think we've been given enough information um, from the city on um, how this will play out to for me to at least feel comfortable with um, applying standard age. Other commissioners? Shall I call on you, Matt? What do you think? Um, I guess I'm Wayne, I think the project has come a long way and looks, uh, they, they respond to a lot of the comments. Um, and there's a clear need for affordable housing, even though that's not one of the standards that we have before us, but that's a clear need. I, I think if it would, would have scored as part of that would have been helpful. Um, and I'm just trying to weigh whether or not this transitions sufficiently enough and whether or not what what the master plan kind of looks for for the area that's just you know across the street on 200 north um and so i certainly you know understand where the community is coming from i know there's certainly a little a little niche in the part of community there that is very tight-knit um and you know, i've done a lot for that that kind of area of town so I'm just, um, about, I mean, that, you know, figuring out that's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm weighing looking at. It's like, I call on. Anyone else want to speak up? I just wanted to, to make sure I understood correctly. Did the applicant mention that he actually owns the properties that are being, uh, torn down to build in this project? Is that correct? Yes, he does. Okay. That's what I wanted to. Thank you. Yes, David, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I want to speak to that, but I also want to just, just say, I, I think tabling it to another recommendation as a designer, given that the item that Amy has brought up is a conditional uh, thing, and I, and I would... I would say that I'm happy to have the traffic study done and have transportation involved, but it seems like that could be a conditional use uh, on approval. But that's a condition of approval. A condition of approval, sorry. And a condition of the approval because this was really a design review. Um, and that's all I'd have to say. But yes, to answer your question, uh, we do own those houses right now. But I'm happy to have a traffic study done. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a motion? Um, can I get uh, some clarification from Nick on... Uh, what if if we did put this as a condition to approval i i'm nick do you think it would it would end up giving us information that we need to address this increased load because sometimes i feel like what we see from transportation is like yeah it's good 
No, nah. and they don't. It doesn't follow through unless they have very specific um, verbiage to ask them what we want. What are your What are your feelings on that? Um, well, if you if you look at that standard age, and I'm going to read it. Um, so everybody knows what we're talking about. It says parking and on-site circulation shall be provided with an emphasis on making safe pedestrian connections to the sidewalk, transit facilities, or mid-block walkway. So what it's getting at is what impact is, does the building itself, the use itself have on those three things? The sidewalk, the, the connections to the sidewalk, the connections to the transit station, which is off-site. I think that's a key thing is that that's to another location. And so if, if there is a concern about what it does to crosswalks and sidewalks and things like that, then that's something that, that we could we could take a look at and, and figure that out. Um, okay, so because, yeah, I mean, I am concerned with the load at that intersection and how that plays out then with how um, not only vehicles, but when I talk about that is how people are going to move through that set because it has big vehicle uh, traffic since I live right off 21st South. I know how that does affect pedestrian movement and safety. So if, if we, if I proposed a condition that they work with transportation to do a study to, um, to address um, that increased load of how it would affect that, that pedestrian vehicle circulation, that would be sufficient? Um, yeah, you, you could make that, you could do that based on that standard. I would think that you, you'd want to have some sort of, I don't know the right word I'm looking for, but. Objective. A, a some of, some it, yeah, object. It's one thing to just do this, to just do this study. Yeah. Exactly, and I think that was my initial, that was my initial concern was like, I don't want to just say, hey, transportation, do this study, because then they'll just do the basic. I wanted yeah. to give them some direction and objective that I would like them to meet. So the problem with um, putting it out the condition and then we never see it again is, do I feel comfortable or confident that transportation will will address those specific concerns. And so I'd want to word it in a way that gave staff enough direction as they were the ultimate reviewer of that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you what, what I think my, my hunch is with any sort of study is that at best it's probably going to try it's going to identify improvements to that, inter, pedestrian improvements to that intersection to make it safer. It's probably not going to deal with the with the number of cars, and the reason why I say that is because um, it is typically safer to deal with vehicles at controlled intersections like that at 600 West and, and 200 North, and by controlled, I mean there's stop signs and things like that versus where vehicles are entering and exiting a building where you don't have those same controls, even though technically and legally, every car that's leaving private property is supposed to stop before it crosses a sidewalk, we all know very few actually do that. Um, and there's, you can't really sign it. To, I mean, you could put some stop signs at the drive exit, but they're not enforceable by the city because it's on private property. So I think that my hunch is that would be the, the, if there is an outcome that includes any sort of change, it would be something along those lines. So I feel like that's satisfactory to me. Uh, so I'm still waiting for a, um, a motion. I'll make one then. Give me a minute to change my screen to get to it. Okay, so if I if I um, want to just add a condition, do I can I just go with the first motion 
Or do I need to go with the second motion and just say all of the above and then add a condition? Because it's broken out into like motion to approve with conditions modified. I don't really want to modify any of the proposed eight conditions in the original motion. I just want to add one. You could you can do it on the first one and then add to the and add to it. All right, then I'll read that one. Uh, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the design review request, including modifications to the maximum distance between building entrances, maximum length of a blank wall, and maximum length of a street facing facade, PLN PCM 2020 00258, for the Cruzel House Apartments project located at approximately 175 North, 600 West. The recommendation is based on the conditions of approval listed below with the addition of a condition nine that a traffic study be conducted with transportation, um, specifically looking at the circulation of this increased traffic load and the pedestrian connectivity and safety regarding that intersection on 200 North and 600 West. Final details regarding these conditions of approval are delegated to planning staff. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Is that John? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have a motion by Amy and a second by John. Um, we're gonna go through again. Um, so I'm gonna start with Maureen. I'll just say this is much improved over the last design that they had. Mm -hmm. I like it much better. Um, yes. Amy? Yes. Adrian? I recused myself previously due to the I'm conflict sorry. of interest. Of course. Uh, Carolyn? Yes. Agreed. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Andres? Um, <clears throat> I don't know that a, that a study is going to um, um, to make a difference on the case. I will vote no. Uh, Sarah? Oh. Did you hear? Hello, yes? We can hear you. Yes? Uh, I vote yes. Thank you. Uh, we have six votes for yay and one no, and the motion passes. Thank you. Madam Chair, before before we move on, can I make a statement? Um, we've heard a lot of comments about displacement, gentrification, affordable housing, and things like that. And I, I want to let everybody know that um, yesterday we had a briefing with the city council where we talked about these very things. and. The city is working on a couple of key changes to the development regulations in the city um, that will hopefully help address those issues and concerns. One is housing loss mitigation, which would deal with um, what happens when somebody's replacing existing housing units and particularly existing affordable housing units, whether they are um, uh, income restricted based on how they were created or if they're naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and then the other is that the city talked um, about uh, not the first time, but but it's probably the first time that there seems to be a lot of agreement with the decision makers of proceeding with um, an inclusionary housing policy for the city. So the reason why I want to bring that up is that I, I hope that everybody who um, attend, who participated in, in this particular item and raised some concerns participate in that process so that uh, we can make that as functional and effective and equitable as we possibly can. Um, we recognize that we have a severe housing affordability issue in this city and it's going to require some some drastic measures to address that, um, particularly one thing that we're seeing is in the West Side neighborhoods where home values are rapidly increasing and pricing people out uh, at, at a rate that is very alarming. And so I wanted to bring that up. 
um, they can go to hopefully um, information will be up on our website, but you're happy to contact me if you want to be involved with that and I'll, I'll start creating a list and making sure everybody that wants to be involved is uh, the best way to contact me is through my email nick.norris at slcgov.com. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now move on to our third item, after which we will have a five minute break. So uh, the third item is Learned Avenue Alley Vacation at approximately 1025 West North Temple. Uh, and the count, it's a uh, case number PLN PCM 2020-00572. And it is uh, going to be presented by Aaron Barlow. Good evening. Uh Planning commissioners, we'll get through this quickly as soon as Nick shares control. So this is a request from Jared Hall to uh, vacate the, the alley of the property, behind the property located at 1025 West North Temple. And he's representing Riley Rogers, the owner of surrounding properties. This request is before you today because alley vacation petitions require planning commission review to provide a recommendation to the city council who makes all final decisions on vacations of public rights of way. The subject alley is six and a half feet wide and approximately 20 feet long. And I'm not, there we go. My computer is not moving there. Um, and it runs east to west parallel to Learned Avenue in North Temple from the adjacent North-South Alley to a dead end. As far back as we know, the alley has functioned as an extension of the parking lot serving the adjacent restaurant and does not pr provide access to required parking. And it does provide access for one of the single family homes facing Learned Avenue. Um, there is no signage or other indication that clearly demarcates public property. Additionally, the hey, alley Aaron? ends. Yes. Are you, are you, are we supposed to be able to see a presentation? Can you not see it? No, nope. we can't. Sorry, everybody. Is it working now? It started. There we go. I'm yeah. so sorry. Um, so going back, you can see where the alley is. It's parallel to uh, North Temple and Leonard Avenue. It's about 180 feet long, 16 and a half feet wide. Um, it does not seem to serve any other purpose than parking for adjacent properties. All parcels adjacent to the alley are owned by Riley Rogers, who plans to redevelop um, the, them into multifamily residential buildings with some ground floor commercial uses facing North Temple. The applicant has argued that this vacation request is necessary for the proposed development. One issue that comes up with the proposal to vacate alleys are questions about the alley serving other potentially beneficial uses in the area. For instance, alleys often serve as mid-block walkways for pedestrians as a positive urban design element. This alley runs east to west, intersecting with the adjacent north-south alley to a dead end. As such, this alley does not connect any street to another, thus not significantly improving pedestrian accessibility. The subject alley abuts four existing single-family houses. Um, and this goes back to that conversation we've had in the past two items. Um, redeveloping this block and demolishing the existing single family houses will displace their current residents. While their plans are preliminary, the applicant has not made any indication that an affordable housing component will be incorporated into the proposed project. Recent housing related conversations with city council members have indicated that alleviating displacement of existing housing is a priority of the city. Staff recommends that if the alley is vacated, the developer mitigates the housing displacement, displacement by including an affordable housing element into the future development. Staff recommends approval of this request provided that one, the applicant works with city council on an affordable housing component and two, the method of disposition is consistent with relevant city ordinances. I'm happy to answer any questions and Jared Hall is available also to answer questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Aaron at this time? Actually, I have a question. So the houses on this site actually that back up to this alley, um, do they all um, have parking access or only their parking access from the alley or just a few of them? Just this corner property. I'm sorry. 
right here. The, all the other homes, there is a garage access, but the, all the required parking for, except for this home on the corner, um, let me rephrase that. Only this home on the corner has required parking access from this alley, and they can access that parking from the adjacent north-south alley. I see. Uh, so that property is owned by the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Are there any additional questions for Aaron before we move on to the applicant? Can we require an affordable housing? Thanks, part of an alley vacation. We've never dealt with that issue before. Don't see why not. <laughs> so, so this is this is a little bit of an interesting thing because this is a legislative function. You're making a recommendation to the city council to consider that. So um, that's something that that they they might be able to do. Um, and we'll we'll out deal with with that the, as we get to the city council. But um, you can condition alley vacations um, that further the when they may have an impact on the public interest. And so um, that's something that to consider as well. And I don't know if if Paul wants to be put on the spot to weigh in on that um, question or not, but. Uh, I'm happy to answer it. Could you repeat the question? Sorry, I was dealing with a, an email. Just, I mean, I, I just asked whether or not we can actually condition an allocation on a development of that alley, includes an affordable housing component. You know, I just don't know whether we've never done anything like that. You know, I, I've, I've got a, a similar uh, inquiry from the city council office about um potential development agreements on um, alley vacations where there's a desire to incorporate a design element so um that's something when i uh, am able to answer city council's question on that I i'm sure it will apply to this kind of a situation as well um it's a little bit complicated uh street and alley vacations are complex uh, under the case law based on how it was that the city acquired the uh, street or alley. Um, and I'm not gonna bore you with all the details, but um, it's, it, it's not easy to give a, a straight answer on that kind of a question right now. Maybe condition's the wrong word, but a recommendation along with this recommendation? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, can, you can provide a recommendation, the city council will do what they're gonna do, um, but still, if they were to uh, include a condition uh, on a vacation, um, there, there still are complexities based on how the city acquired uh, the right of way. And um, sure. case law, is not super helpful on that kind of a situation. Okay, thanks. And the statutes, the statutes are even worse, so. So we could say something like to the extent permissible under Utah law, recommend that that would be a condition and then the that, city council yeah. can vet it. Right. And, and Matt, just for reference, the, in the staff report, one of the conditions is the applicant works with the city council and relevant city departments on an agreement that addresses nope. displacement of four existing I, family homes. I, I, get, I get that. I'm just wondering if we can do that, but uh, that's fine. We can move forward. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, do we want to hear from the applicant, please? Jared? Yeah. Hello. My name is Jared Hall. Good evening, commissioners. So I am the architect on this project, representing the property owners. Uh, the property owner owns both the restaurant parcel to the north and the four houses to the south. So we own 100% of the adjacent properties to this alley. Um, this uh, 
the we have examined options where we would develop these as uh, as separate buildings leaving the alley, but and we get the same number of units, but we actually get dramatically less parking. And so one of the main reasons we want to do this is a, it makes the building more efficient for the parking because, and we know that's a deep concern of the community on all projects that come before you, and this one would be the same. And so like with this alley vacation, we're able to get very nearly a one-to-one -one parking ratio, which is better than most all other projects coming from the TSA zone. Um, and another issue we had, like if both of this property to the north and to the south get developed as right, then you have this weird alley between them, which especially given the current conditions of the area, we're concerned will become a very a magnet for crime because there will be I mean, no street frontage, like no eyes on it from the general public streets would only be from the apartments. And also because this part, this alleyway to, runs east and west and is a dead end with just our parcels, we don't feel it serves any larger public use. But as we develop this project, the north-south alley will get redeveloped and have new paving so it will actually be useful as a mid-block walkway or for vehicle access. Um, with that, I'm available for any questions you have for us. Thank you, Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the applicant at this time before we open the public hearing? All right, we're going to open a public hearing. Um, do we have anyone from the community council? It does not look like we do, at least we don't have a recognized name, and I am not seeing any raised hands or anyone who's indicated that they would like to speak. Um, Wayne, do you know if we've had any um, emails this afternoon on this item? Uh, we, we have not. All right, seeing, oh, uh, I do have one uh, yeah. person here. Yep, we do have a hand up. There we go. Um, Antonio. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm not really aware of this project. Um, are you guys going to be destroying the, the, the Panda Buffet and, uh, and the Asadero restaurant just to put these up? And I want to ask a question too, like how, what are the, are these apartments going to be affordable to the people in the neighborhood in Rose Park, in Popular Grove. Okay, thank you for your comment. We'll try to get back to, to uh, the um, applicant with us once we close the public hearing. Any? Are there any other comments? Um, I do not see any other hands being raised. Do we um, going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission? Uh, would the applicant like to answer the question from Antonio? Yeah, so the Panda Buffet is part of this redevelopment. The uh, Acerdo restaurant on the corner is not. We would not have anything to do with that. Um, at this point, I don't believe the developer has uh, applied for any affordable housing uh, credits, we would be doing this as a market rate apartment building. Okay, thank you. Does the commission have any other questions or comments on this project? Can I please have a um, motion? I'll make the motion. Uh, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, the policy considerations for alley vacation and the input received, and move the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council for the alley vacation proposed in PLN PCM 2020-00572 with the conditions listed in the staff report. I'll second that. 
I have a motion by Maureen and a second by Carolyn. So we're going to go back to the roll call again. Um, Maureen? Which, yes. Sorry, would you be able to amendment of, uh, that would just add that the city council also explore adding an affordable housing component to a future development on this place, not just addressing the displacement of the four existing households. Is that a friendly amendment, Maureen? Sure. Okay. We have a motion and amendment. Um, so we'll make a vote. Maureen? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adrian? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Andreas? I'll vote yes. Uh, Sarah? I'm actually going to vote no on this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes uh, for recommending to the city council. That would be seven to four and one against. Um, next item on our agenda uh, will be uh, there in five minutes. I need to take a bathroom break. So, um, all of you. Five minutes. Okay, 808. <laughs> if you're here, can you turn on your um, video? I'm here, though. I'm going to. Okay, mute. thank you, John. So I'm muted. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. This is okay. Sarah. I'm here. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Okay, I believe we are. Amy, are you here? Carolyn, I'm going to wait one more minute, see if they come back. I'm here. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Amy's here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our next item on the agenda. Uh, Green, Green Pit Gateway Apartments, Plan Development and Design Review at approximately 592 West 200 South. Uh, it's case number PLN PCM 2020-00493 and PLN PCM 2020-00749. And our presenter is, our staff presenter is Dave Gellner. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, going to share content of a short presentation. You noted the case numbers, and this is for both a plan development and design review request for the Green Current Gateway Apartments. Uh, share content. Is that coming through? Yes, it is. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is design review and plan development. It's for a proposed 150 unit apartment building, which includes a mix of micro and studio apartment units, a type that isn't generally found in the Gateway District. Um, it's in the GMU zoning district. It's three pieces of property or three parcels. It's about 0 0.59 acres when it will be consolidated. And the GMU district requires plan development approval for all new principal uses. And then the design review request is to modify the design features, including the materials being used and the length of the link walls on the west facade. So here's a, an overview of the site. Um, again, I mentioned it's three parcels. They have also filed a lot consolidation application, which will be reviewed by staff administratively. Uh, here's a rendering looking towards the uh, southwest corner of the proposed building. Uh, again, it has frontage on both 200 south, 600 west. And I'll let the applicant talk about it as more, but there's two commercial spaces that will front on 200 south, and the one will also look on to 600 west. Uh, basic site layout, the parking. Uh, it includes 38 spaces for the units. There's 19 underneath the building and 19 in the surface parking lot behind the building. 
the applicant has been working with staff to change several aspects of the original design uh, to better meet the standards. I, I only mention that because sometimes when these, by the time these come to the planning commission, we've been working with an applicant and several iterations have already gone on. Um, just to their credit, they've been willing to work with staff on this. Uh, they're requesting modification of the following items to the design review process. Uh, they have a, they use a hardy board on the side of the buildings. They're, Hardy is not listed as a durable material in the GMU zoning district, although it has been used uh, on a number of other projects, including the Beverly in recent times in the nearby area. And also they're looking at, they have a blank wall section on the 600 West Street facing facade um, that is approximately 27 feet in length. So they're exceeding the maximum 15 foot blank wall uh, requirement in the district. Um, something that came up uh, kind of latently in the review process was that there's a required parking lot landscaping buffer on the north side of the lot between their property and the property to the north, which is the Centro Civico property. And they haven't shown that on their plans. Again, it was identified latently in the process. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, subject property, here's an oblique aerial view. And here's uh, looking across 600, I mean, sorry, 200 south from the south side, uh, across the tracks line towards what is the three properties that are used largely for auto repair. Uh, this is from the corner of 200 south, 600 west. And again, looking towards the corner, you do see the Centro Civico Senior Housing Project just to the north uh, of the property. It sits, it abuts the Centro Civico site. The Senior Housing Project was approved in 2017, also GMU. It's similar in scale and a lot of the design features to the project that's being proposed near the corner. Uh, again, a little bit more context. This is on 600 West, looking kind of southeasterly, and you see the Central Station apartments uh, being built on that side of 200 South. So there is a lot of development in the area given the transit accessibility. Uh, street view along 200 South, the existing street trees on that side of the property would be retained. Uh, Key considerations was the neighborhood compatibility and context, how this fits into the area, the master plan compliance. Uh, also the de design details and public realm experience, uh, the things that are being modified are those material choices and the length of blank wall sections allowed and that would be broken up with public art would be the proposal. And then there are a couple of design standards outlined in the report that were not matter undetermined. Um, one of the design standards we look for in design review is the building having a base, middle, and top, uh, some cornice details and that. Uh, those are not included in this building. So again, that is one standard that wasn't met and was unable to determine the window recesses. There are some how those windows are recessed into the building. And again, a little bit of discussion on that parking lot landscaper buffing buffer that's required on the north side of the lot. It's a seven foot landscaping buffer that could be reduced through the plan development process. And the applicant will be prepared to talk a little bit more about that. Um, staff felt it generally met the design review and plan development standards and where the standards are not being met, modification has been requested through the design review process. And that landscaping buffer on the north side of the uh, surface parking uh, could be modified through the plan development process. So in short, we're recommending that the Planning Commission approve the plan development and design review subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Are there any questions for David? I, I actually have a question. So you're saying that some parts of this aren't, we do not have enough information, but you're not recommending that those become conditions for later? 
Yes, yes, we are recommending those. So the, where the where it's, it would be a condition of approval, the window details and things like that. Okay, I don't see that on the staff recommendation. Okay, all right. All right, thank you. Um, anyone else have questions for David at this point? Um, just a follow up question to, to um, Brenda's question. If, if we don't have enough detail to, to make that determination, is there a reason why we don't have the applicant provide that as part of the approval as opposed to having it a condition of approval? How is that determination made? Um, case by case basis. In, in some cases, we, we do try to have all those details, but we don't always get them necessarily. And so there are a number of details that we look at aren't, aren't going to change the physical layout of the building or the site that we deal with them at the building permit process. Okay. Ensuring compliance. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to uh, the applicant. Okay, thank you. This is Mark Eddy. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you for your time this evening. And I'll try to be brief. Um, I know you've been at it for a while here, but uh, please don't take that brevity as a sign that I'm unwilling to answer any questions you might have. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with David. He's been very helpful throughout this entire process. And as he's mentioned, since we originally submitted in June, we've been back and forth for months now trying to fine tune and make sure that we've identified anything that would be contrary to the zone. Our intent is to deliver 150 units um, to, the, to the Gateway District and the proximity to the old Greektown track station certainly will enhance the, the walkability, the, the transit oriented multifamily feel in this critical area of downtown. Um, let me just speak briefly to the two items mentioned. First, the cementitious siding or hardy siding being considered as a durable material. I found it instructive as I was reading the, the zone, the ordinance itself lists the following as approved materials, brick, masonry, textured or patterned concrete and or cut stone. And then it essentially lists the following as the materials they're trying to avoid probably because they're maybe considered at least if they're used in a great amount as a little bit less attractive or less durable over time. And that list includes EFIS, corrugated metal, vinyl, and aluminum siding. So as we sort of separate those into two groups, our, our position is essentially that this cementitious siding, which has been used as mentioned in this area quite, quite a bit actually, falls into the category more of the durable type material that we're trying to see as, as part of that overall 70% requirement on exterior materials. We've incorporated it um, throughout in our proposed design and it actually breaks up because it brings some texture, it actually breaks up some pretty large horizontal planes along the facades and uh, are doing that not only for color but also for the texture in the building. And so uh, we would uh, respectfully request that Hardy, as it has been previously, be considered compatible and can be considered then a portion of that 70% requirement. The, the second part uh, talks to the, uh, the 15 foot maximum length of a blank wall. And along the, the 600 west facade on the ground floor, there's a section in between the retail storefront glass, more toward the corner of 2nd and 6th, and then the other glass that's sort of up the street from uh, along 600, there's this center section that's recessed, uh, even at the ground floor level, um, that does uh, measure in distance greater than 15 feet. The concept there in that recessed portion is for us to install art. 
in that area. As we've sort of driven around the area, we've seen a lot of uh, murals, painted murals along the sides of buildings. But we've, we want to bring something down to that ground floor level and engage the pedestrians there a little bit differently. Again, just by way of reference, the ordinance says uh, the maximum length of any blank wall uninterrupted by doors, art, or architectural detailing at the first floor level shall be 15 feet. So art is actually mentioned uh, as a break, if you will. And, and that's essentially what we're asking uh, to, for the approval to, to be included. Even though it's already in the ordinance, out of an abundance of caution, because it does, as you look at that board formed concrete space, you don't see the artwork there, but it is designated as, um, as a place where we'll install art. As far as the ordinance's um, definition of public art, uh, it does expand beyond murals. Of course, it says um, artists work integrated into the design of the building, landscaping, sculpture, painting, murals, glass, mixed media, or work by artisans. Our, our idea currently is more than mixed media, a metallic uh, sculpture that would be installed. It'll sort of climb up the wall there in that recessed area and it'll break up the, the, the plane sufficiently. And so we would request based upon that uh, recessed portion being designated as our art area, that that we would be considered sufficient to break up, break up that plane. And David, I saw your chat, your text that you could show that again, if you don't mind um, it, sharing just that portion, sort of point out where we're talking about. Okay. Hi. Figure for context that might be okay. that worked. I pulled up the four elevation. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the bottom left, you can see the, the storefront glass on the corner. And then as you work toward the back of the building, you see the door into the underground garage and then also some windows. But there's that center section that's set back. That's, that's where the art would be located. Um, and again, the theory being that if it's a little bit closer to the pedestrian, that it would be engaging along that sixth west sidewalk a little bit more than a mural that might be higher up on the wall. I'll just briefly mention, this is a good view actually to talk about it. Um, you see that, that there isn't a cornice, as David mentioned. There are some, uh, we've included some vertical, or I'm sorry, some horizontal uh, along the top of those units over the balconies um, and overhang there to break up the weather and to make those spaces a little bit more habitable and nice uh, on the top floor level. What we've used as our design along the top here really reference to the Centro Civico um, senior apartments and then also sort of kitty corner a little closer. Let's see, that would be northeast toward the, the gateway another building there that really has a very similar termination um, on the on the top side. So re really sort of trying to fit in. It was one of the standards or guidelines that we saw as we were reviewing it that we needed to tie into the buildings that were around us. And so that's why we've designed the top level in the way that we have. Any, any questions, anything I could address? So I, I yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, my question. <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> okay, my question is about the uh, west elevation. Can you put the uh, David? Can you share that again, please? Yeah. The elevation drawing. Sorry about that. I was closing it as you mentioned it. Okay. Um, the west elevation, uh, unlike the other elevations, uh, I'm assuming the east elevation also has the same issue. Actually, it doesn't. Uh, the west elevation is particularly plain and uh, above the level of the street and uh, has really no windows and uh, and very or very few uh, smattering of windows and extremely plain. And um, which would be pretty acceptable if this were a building where we anticipated that, um, you know, another building was going to be built next door to it or close to it. But here we have a corner and 200 South is actually, um, so can you, can you tell us why we don't have any fenestration on that? 
Yes. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, I'll tell you the reason. It, if we could go behind that wall and into those uh, studio apartments that are right along or that share that wall, what you see when you're on the inside of it is the kitchen that sort of runs along part of that. And then uh, really the only blank wall space for hanging a TV or backing a bed into, because as you come around the corner, you see the, the balconies along the other side. Um, and so we actually reduced the size of the windows. There's still windows and natural light that are coming in through those smaller windows on the corner, but everything you basically see to the north of that small window on the corner is is room for use on the interior to, to not break up that interior space. Um, built a, a similar project um, on West Temple and Ninth South, 145 units there. And one of the key pieces of feedback we got from our tenants as we were leasing up was that there was almost nowhere to pay anything on the inside. And so that is the practical reason, the honest to goodness reason that uh, it's that way. Now, what we've done to try to address that, you can see that there are recessed portions to sort of create four instead of just two towers in between the two where the color changes and then a courtyard that goes back in that will be an out so um also we don't have plans for these units we don't have plans at the second and third above the first floor to help us figure that one out either is that correct uh yeah i i think that's correct um we, we have them designed but um i did not believe that it was required of us i don't think we we were asked to provide it or didn't provide it we certainly could um right. but that that would illustrate the what I, I guess what i'm trying to describe in words right yes it would okay thank you are there any other questions for the applicant before we open the public hearing I had a question about the landscaping plan and why you're going with a fence instead of the landscape buffer. Yeah, uh, David, could you perhaps, thanks for driving this by the way, but you could you show that portion as well? Uh, yes, yeah, one moment I'll get to it for you. Uh, we're, we're fencing in the uh, surface parking in that area to create some separation from the street and the landscape buffer does that as well. And there is some, some buffer there, um, but also for security purposes, um, because then you access the underground parking, which comes out of that same location, which obviously leads then into the building itself. And so you'll see as you come off the sidewalk on sixth, there will be a, a large landscape buffer prior to the gate. And then the gate will lead into the surface parking area which will also have its islands as required inside of the, you know, certain number of stalls as, as designated there. So can you see that there? Does that help to answer the question? Or was, so, did I miss oh, it? so your, your entire parking area will be gated with a, an access gate to get in and out. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. That is correct. And that yeah. looks directly north of your city. Yeah, with the central civico building uh the old one the the one or so story building that, that's left over there not the senior apartments that's built just to the to the north of that okay so as this develops presumably along that northern boundary we will have um some buffer on essentially on both sides of the the boundary line there when when and if that eventually develops i understand that there are some plans but i haven't confirmed that so uh, uh jared forsyth um can we give him access to go ahead and show the plans whoever's giving access nick or david Whoever has. I think okay. Nick will give him access. I just did, so he should be able to share his screen. Okay, thank you. Jared, go ahead. Okay. Hi, this is Jared. Um, I am the architect. Let me grab the screen real quick. Okay. Do you, do you see my, my screen now? Yes. Yeah, let me find my mouse. Okay. 
So uh, south is down, north is up. And that, this is the west uh, facade over here. You can see we've got these pretty small units right here with the bathrooms up against there. And, you know, as we've laid these out and thought where people could put a bed, uh, lots of places right here, lots of places over right here. Um, and as Mark indicated, uh, one of the one of the biggest things we've we've found from doing other units like this is is wall space. And so uh, we did want to break this facade up as much as we can, but trying to keep as much wall space as possible. So we did put a window in that facade uh, in each one of these units. Um, and trying to keep as much wall space as we can. Um, so here's here's a, a, a rendering um, of it, and you can kind of see, I think this gives a little bit better idea of how that is articulated. The other thing that I also wanted to bring up is the three-inch recess. We, we did address that, um, and I'm not sure why it didn't make it in, but basically what we've done and this, this is not a finalized detail, please understand that, but what we've done is we've popped out, we put the windows in and then we're gonna pop out uh, like a stucco trim around to give some, uh, some depth to the facade. Uh, and that you can see, you can kind of see it, you can see it in here. So around all the windows, we will have that added depth there to achieve that three inch required um, dimension there. Thank you. So, uh, is there any question? I mean, I can answer any other questions you might have about that. But. I think we're okay right now. Let's go okay. ahead and go to the public hearing, unless uh, com other commissioners have something they need clarification on at this point. Okay. So, do we? I'm going to uh, go ahead and open the public hearing. <laughs> Do we have anybody who wishes to speak? I do not see any hands raised at the moment. And we don't have any emails that have come in. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. These are still market rate units are not affordable other than just that they're small and so we're saying they're affordable is, is that, that a question yeah. yeah to the applicant yes okay that is correct it is a market rate project but as you've mentioned because of the size um, okay. these rent for less than a thousand a month inclusive of fees so they're in the eight to nine hundred dollar range. Can you take us through the materials on the outside of this? Um, I know you're asking for the hardy board. Is everything hardy board, or can you just take me through it? Do you want me to address that, Mark? Yes, thanks, Jeff. So, can you still see my the image that's up? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. So this kind of gray, gray portion, well, let me start at the base. The base is going to be concrete. We're going to have board formed concrete. And then this kind of um, inverted U will be uh, brick, thin brick material right in here. This, this bluish color and the orange color would be a horizontal hardy board, hardy board, excuse me. And then the white is stucco. And then, uh, and then we would have, uh, just a, you know, metal soffit and fascia around those. Those are the three materials that we have on the um, Jared, I did include the material board in the Planning Commission staff report, but I have it here to pull up if you need it. I can show that as well. So here is, there it is. Oops. <laughs> That. So those are that's essentially the color board. I, I don't have anything representing concrete there that um, it would just be a raw raw concrete with the hardy board texture. Or excuse me, the the um, 
um, board form texture. <clears throat> Okay, are there any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Would anyone like to make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony, and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission vote to approve the proposed plan development and design review applications for the Green Print Gateway Apartments located at approximately 592 West 200 South, files PLM PCM 2020-00493 and PLM PCM 2020-00749 with the conditions of approval listed in the staff report. Um, I'll second. Thank you, Maureen. Hey, one comment before the, the take a vote. Would that include modification to the landscape buffer? Or elimination of it? I'm not, clear, I'm not clear what landscape buffer we're talking about. Is it on the north end of the parking lot instead of a fence there? Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes, That's on the north saying. side of the surface parking lot between Centro, the Centro Civico property. So there, there yeah. should be a landscape buffer there. And how big should that landscape buffer be? Seven feet. Seven feet. Right. Okay. Yes, that would include a waiver of that requirement. It, um, Maureen, is that okay with you? Is acceptable as a yes? That's fine. okay. All right, I have a motion from Adrian and a second for Maureen. Um, so I'm going to go down the list. Maureen, yes. Amy, yeah. I don't feel like this. There's way too many outstanding questions to me on this, so I'm voting no. Okay, Adrian. Yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Uh, I'd say yes, but I would like to just mention that, you know, when we talk about relating to buildings, that's about context and scale, not copying details. And I think that the architecture could be a lot better on this. Um, but I'll, I'll say yes. Matt? Yeah, I um, feel like we're seeing this building a lot pop up around Salt Lake, particularly in some of these downtown areas. I think <laughs> the, the building that we, we saw before that the neighborhood was upset about had a similar uh, like market, but was just so much more interesting and better. And I, I'm really struggling with seeing this type of building. I and mean, although I'm my mind is not in a place right now to really come up with a great narrative or so I'll, I'll vote yes for now, but I, I do think we we're seeing this like three color sort of blocky sort of thing all over Salt Lake and they don't look great. So I'll, I'll vote yes this time. Okay. Andres. I will vote uh, yes. Sarah. It looks like we've lost Sarah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying her name up anymore unless she was. Sarah, are you there? I just received an email from her saying that she's going to try to log back in. Okay. Well, I'm going to put her as abstaining for right now. Um, and so we have um, six, four, and one against, and so the motion passes, um, and so we shall move on. Thank you very much for everyone for your presentation. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mar Marlene, when you do the minutes for this, will you just note that Sarah had technical issues and, and wasn't present in the meeting to vote? Yep, got it. 
Thank you. You're welcome. So now we're going to move on to the final um, item for tonight. Rezone at approximately 860 and 868 East 3rd Avenue. Case number PLN PCM 2020-00703. And Mayara is going to be making the presentation for us. All right, I'll just wait for Nick to pass the ball to me. I'm working on it. Hang on. <laughs> Unfortunately, your your new name is far enough down that I have to separate my panel <laughs> to get to next, it. Next one Sorry. I'll up with a letter A. There's a lot of M's on here. Okay. All right. So this is a request to rezone the properties at 860 and 868 East 3rd Avenue from CN and SR1A to RMU 35. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to City Council for the proposed zoning map amendment with the condition that the future development include a commercial component at the intersection of 3rd Avenue and N Street. This condition and other key considerations will be explained later in the presentation. Um, so this, this property, uh, this rezone involves two properties, one that contains a gas station and auto repair and another that contains a single family dwelling. The purpose of the rezone is to allow for multifamily development as shown on the conceptual plan above. Um, and this plan shows the applicant's intent the applicant's intent is to demolish the commercial structures and maintain the single family dwelling, combine the two lots and build a townhome development. The properties are located within the Avenue's local historic district and any future development, including demolition, will require HLC approval. While the applicant, the applicant has uh, provided a conceptual development plan, this result is not associated with a specific development. The conceptual plan serves as an indication of the applicant's intent, uh, but the rezone should be considered on its own. The existing structures are considered non-complying uh, to the current zoning standards, which means that they were um, they don't meet all the standards because they were built prior to these sta standards being put in place. So that's what the table on the screen shows, um, that uh, the structures will continue to be non-complying with the proposed zoning district as they are right now. And in attachment E of the staff, staff, staff report <laughs> shows that the degree of non-compliance non would be pretty similar. Um, any new development will need to comply with the proposed zoning standards or request modifications to DHLC. Uh, the, the demolition of the structures of 860, however, uh, would help with the siting of a new development and that could mean uh, more density uh, that is also considering that the proposed zoning would allow an additional 10 feet in height. However, when compared to the CN zoning district, which has no density requirements for mixed use development and the size of the combined properties, it is unlikely that this rezone will result in a significant increase in number of units. The form of a new development is also more relevant than the number of units. The form is what guarantees compatible development and HLC will review the form of the building of a new building and a required landscape buffer that will be required in a new development will, could help mitigate potential impacts to abutting properties. Acknowledging also that density creates fears of traffic increase, staff looked at the transportation options available at the property and this area includes sidewalks, bike lanes and bus stops that support the one stall off street parking requirement of the proposed zone. The second consideration uh, was the possible loss of commercial use in this node. Um, the property at 860 East 3rd East Avenue has had commercial uses for over a century. The sandbar, sandbar maps and historical areas show that a store was located on the intersection of 3rd Avenue and N Street since at least 1911. So this commercial corner is pretty established. The Avenue's master plan offers limited opportunities to add future commercial zones in the neighborhood so the loss of this already designated commercial property could mean a reduction of services uh, at the community level and could alter the character of the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood node 
offers not only commercial support to immediate residents, but also enhances the area in terms of urban design, which includes providing a place to gather, support walkability, and give life to the street. So staff is recommending that the rezone be conditioned on maintaining a commercial component on that corner. Uh, lastly, the rezone would allow for the conversion of the existing single family dwelling into a non-residential use, which would be essentially an expansion of commercial uses into an established residential area. The future land use map, which is shown on the screen of the Avenue's master plan, is not clear on the vision for the specific property because the map is not intended to be a rule of law, but, uh, serve as a guidance. So. Uh, it doesn't show any property boundaries. So any, anyone could interpret this in either way, but the redevelopment of the properties would certainly be easier with a with one single zoning district. The rezone uh, would allow for the elimination of the residential unit, however, so um, a housing loss mitigation plan was required. The report included in the staff report shows that the applicant is not charged for the possible loss of the unit as a result of the rezone but the applicant has expressed interest in maintaining the single family dwelling as is. This is especially relevant because the house is listed as contributing to the historic district and demolition will likely be denied. Any other exterior modifications to the structure, including those to accommodate another use, will be reviewed for compliance with the standards of the overlay historic district, oh, the historic overlay district. While the review focus on design elements, on the exterior of the building, a conversion to another use will likely trigger major building improvements for compliance with building and fire code. An HLC review could somewhat limit the intensity of a house conversion. The proposal is found to comply with several of the Avenue's master plan and Plan Salt Lake policies as listed on the screen. We did not receive a comment from the community council, but we received multiple emails from the public regarding the re request, mostly are in support and these public comments were either included in the staff report or in the Dropbox for your consideration. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. So, are there any questions for Mayara? We're well, all concerned about the height differences here where SR1, I mean, talking through is, I mean, they talk about SR1A, we talked about before, was like 23 feet. This is significantly larger and hot and taller for the space. So the, the SR1A is 23 and the CN is 25. Because this house is considered contributing, the height is not so much of an issue, at least for staff, because that will be reviewed uh, for compliance with HLC. Um, and we, we don't usually approve uh, second story additions to existing contributing structures. She can get an addition to the back or to the side, but we usually don't approve. Uh, for, sorry. For rezoning it to RMU 35 is a pretty significant increase in allowable height, isn't it? From the CN? Yes. It's 10 feet. Yeah. It would be one story. Okay. Thank you. And the rest of the zones, all, I mean, all the houses around that are all it's pretty consistent in that area. It's all. SR1A. There are SR1A, but you, you might want to keep in mind that the SR1A zoning came after the most of the buildings that are there uh, were built. So it could be there could be some buildings that are a little higher than that. But the current zone is SR1A, and that's what the, and the master plan that was done there advises that. The master the master plan uh, advises to continue to be residential surrounding this the subject properties. Thanks. So Myra, considering the commercial component, I mean, I just wonder whether that's actually truly viable. It's been used as a gas station and auto repair shop for decades. It's it's useful. It's it provides a service that's needed in the area, but I wouldn't say it's it's something that contributes to like an engaging streetscape or um, a gathering place for the community. And you have other locations in the avenues where commercial properties are still vacant, you know, 10 years. I'm thinking of the space right next to Kachina that's been for lease for eight to 10 years um, with no tenant. I, I just wonder whether we're imposing an obligation there that 
won't actually be practical in the long term. And then my second question is, is why is the house being included in the rezone if it's going to remain as a house? And maybe that's a question for the applicant. Um, the first one didn't seem to be a, much of a question, but I'll try to uh, cover that. Um, we feel like uh, because this is zoned commercial, the loss of that would could be something we can't go back to um, because the at least the master plan right now is offered limited opportunities to create commercial in this neighborhood because the area is so established as residential already. Um, so my fear is that the the loss of this um, would be something we can't remediate anytime soon. Um, and I kept the recommendation pretty open um, because there, there are options for that, right? Um, and it's included in the staff report. So we're not limiting what kind of use it has to be. It just says commercial. Um, the applicant has shown interest in doing live work units and that could meet that standard or that condition. Um, it could also be a place, um, just a convertible space. So they would build this um, development per building code and fire code that could accommodate some commercial space and that could be converted later in the future. Um, so I, I kept it pretty open so you could, could create some discussion and you guys can weigh on that and decide if that's a, an appropriate recommendation or not. And then the second one, sorry, I forgot what the second one was. <laughs> why the why the single family oh. residence is included in, as part of this rezone if the intent is to keep it as a single family house. Yeah, I think you can ask that from the applicant, but I imagine it's because of the size of the lot. Um, if you look on, they can just adjust the lot size. I mean, I, I, I'll I'll talk to the applicant. I'll ask but that. The zone, but the zoning would remain the same, so they would have to change the SR one A. And the other thing is, the SR one A for a single family requires five thousand square feet of a lot, so we couldn't adjust that lot too much because the lot has, I can't remember now, but over over five thousand, but not it didn't reach the six thousand. So there's a lot of space that, that they could use if this is combined, if that makes sense. Let's if it's combined, to, season, are they going to combine the lots too? Is that the plan? Yes, that's I, I think we should talk to the applicant. Yeah. Get 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 it from the horse's mouth here. So unless there are other questions, can we move on to talk to the applicant, please? And the applicant is Oren Hillel. Hey, hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, how's everyone doing? We're fine. Thank you for the time tonight. Um, my name's Oren. Um, my partner Marcus is on as well as Kevin, our architect. Um, I, if we can unmute Marcus Robinson and then, you know, probably have Kevin as a presenter, I think that would, uh, that would be great. Hey guys, Marcus is uh, now unmuted. Thanks, Warren. Appreciate it. Uh, you guys are okay with that? I'll, I'll jump in here really quick and and, and do a quick intro again. Uh, I'm, I'm Marcus Robinson with with Remark Investments. Uh, or hello, my partner. Uh, obviously, is also in attendance and, and our architect Kevin Blaylock of uh, Blaylock uh, and Partners is on. Uh, we're definitely very excited to be in front of the Planning Commission and the community tonight. Uh, to discuss our, our zoning map amendment application at 860 East 3rd. Um, as, as, as the previous applicant uh, said before us, uh, we know it's late. You guys have been on for a while. Uh, we will definitely do our best to, to be informative, but, but also brief so you guys uh, uh, can, can get on with your night. But uh, again, very much appreciate you guys being on with us. Uh, first off, we, we definitely wanted to thank Mayara for all of her hard work uh, and the help she's, she's put in. Uh, on this application, we've we've had a really nice time working with her. We also wanted to thank the Greater Avenues Community Council (GACC) uh, for allowing us to to attend and present at at two of their uh, their their recent meetings. Um, we've definitely taken into consideration uh, all of the thoughtful uh, input that, that that we've received, and 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 we do feel like we've we've created something here uh, on these parcels that 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 would be a really nice addition for 
for the Lower Avenues neighborhood. Um, a little background on on me and Oren. Um, I'm actually a a longtime Utah native, uh, and actually met Oren, my my partner, when we were at grad school uh, at, at at USC. Uh, and while at grad school, we, we created a uh, or, or or formed a company uh, with the goal of acquiring properties in Utah that we felt were 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 under uh, underutilized and 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 had the potential for us to you know to work with the different stakeholders uh, there around those properties and and, and really re envision uh, something better for those sites. Um, our architect uh, on the project again is Kevin Blaylock. He's a long time. Uh, Avenues resident, and here shortly he will be presenting a few, a few uh, site plans uh, that we've discussed with 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 the GACC and and the planning department. Um, uh, in regards to uh, Adrian's comment, we 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 definitely understand that 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 there's been a condition uh, proposed to maintain the commercial component on the corner of of Van and Third Avenue. We we spent a considerable amount of time with with our design team working through a design solution that we felt would be would be viable to that corner. Um, to be honest, it's 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 been very difficult for us to find a solution that 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 that, that we feel like will work given the site size uh, and the constraints. Um, and so we definitely wanted to discuss that with planning commission and um, and and the community here tonight to determine if 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 that really is the best path forward. I think I think I. I think a few drawbacks that we're concerned about there with with that condition would be um, additional park and, and traffic strains uh, on the site as as well as um, a high chance of, of retail vacancy given the market environment that we're in at the moment. So very much look look, look forward to discussing this tonight uh, and we'll we'll now turn it over to Kevin to uh, present our site plans. Oh, I think Kevin might be muted. Uh, it's Kevin Blaylock. He's been moved off of the, uh, on down to the attendees list, it looks like. There you go. And if we could also Hi. give Kevin the ability to share his screen, that'd be great. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Blaylock. Uh, can you hear me okay and see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. I actually had to jump off when Marcus was talking, so I missed some of that. I apologize. Um, but as Mayara indicated, um, our, our hope and intent is to uh, attain, obtain approval for the rezone um, and combining these two parcels um allows us the the flexibility to achieve this uh six single family unit uh for sale development basically i think the, the last question i heard was relative to the existing house um it is our intent to maintain that house um restore it renovate it um kind of bring it back to its original historic character um, and have it remain as a single family residence. This uh, red dotted line is the approximate um, parcel boundary for this residential lot. So this house sits on a, on a double wide lot. Um, and as Myara, Myara mentioned, um, by combining these two lots and rezoning all of, or both of them to RMU 35, um, that allows us to take the uh, opportunity to, to get the number of units on the development as desired. So this is, was in um, our planning application submittal. We reviewed this um, with Myara, uh, just at, at kind of a high level, kind of the intent of activating the street, both Third Avenue and N Street um, by varying the facade for these single family homes um, and kind of creating these entry porch like elements to make it more kind of consistent with the, uh, the language in the lower, lower avenues district. Um, included in our application are a number of uh, responses or criteria um, that we went through for Salt Lake City's 
uh, most current planning documents. Um, and we, we definitely appreciate uh, engaging with Myara. She's been fantastic, um, kind of guiding us through the process. We understand and fully embrace that this is the first step. We've got to go through city council. We've got to go through a design exercise with the community council um, and obviously with the HLC group. Our request is um, is really to get to be granted the rezone without the condition of the commercial components um, on the corner. Um, and and really the you know every time that we do these, I'm I'm an architect in Salt Lake City. We do a lot of residential projects, commercial, retail projects, mixed use, for sale, for rent. Um, and then, of course, Marcus and Oren, that's, this is kind of their background. Um, so when we look at a commercial component as part of a, a mixed-use development, we always ask ourselves the, the two questions. Who's the ideal tenant or the owner going to be? And how do we ensure success for that individual or that entity? Um, and the re big thing is trying to reduce the barriers to entry. Um, and to understand the commercial component goals associated with the district. So if just in terms of reducing the barriers, we're, you know, we're, we're not sure if the size, the space, the infrastructure requirements, because we don't know who that tenant or that uh, entity would be. Um, while we're confident that we could address the Salt Lake City zoning requirements for the number of parking stalls, um, in order to make sure that the commercial component would be a success, they would probably have their own set of parking requirements just to make sure that there's enough uh, traffic there. Um, we, we would have to go through another HLC and planning approval process, their building permit approval process. Um, and the, all things pandemic right now, everybody's dealing with the what we kind of coined the, the land of COVID. Um, and with all of the closures, um, there's just a, a really high risk for vacancy really from day one and then the unknown of kind of going into the future. So when we look at the commercial component, the goals for um, a commercial project in this particular neighborhood, really anywhere in Salt Lake City, um, we really believe that all of those goals can uh, are still maximized, are still being achieved with a completely residential component. So it's uh, the developer's intent to, to create six single family walk up brownstone style, um, sensitive single family residences. Um, and I know that that is not what this is totally about, but that is always the first question that we get asked um, in any discussion, including the discussions we've had in the past with the, with the Greater Avenues Community Council. Um, I don't I don't want to take a lot of time. I don't want to kind of read these line by line. We really want to introduce to you the project and our intent so that you had an understanding of what we were asking for. Um, again, we appreciate Myara's flexibility and not kind of pigeoning, pigeonholing the commercial component with the size. However, our request really is to let go of that conditional um, uh, conditional requirement with the rezone request for really also for all of the reasons that uh, Adrian had, had just identified um, with her concern about the, um, the, the fate of, of small commercial right now. So I do have a lot of different kind of diagrams um, and it, I can just kind of walk through and um, in fact it's it is probably worth mentioning this is the project that was proposed in terms of our site development as part of the RMU 35. Um, that was in our planning application that you received from Mayara. The, the Marcus and Oren did ask me to look at, you know, Kevin, what could we do um, just staying within the current zoning restrictions, the SR1A, the single family house stays as it is. What could we do to be co totally compliant within the CN zone. Um, so we did a quick study that's more of a fallback position, um, a quick study that allows 12 to 15 um, small studio apartments 
um, to be co- totally compliant with the CN zone as is currently written. Um, and that would allow them to not have to go through a rezone application, not have to go through a city council approval process, um, and basically just jump right into design and, and work with the HLC. So that, in a nutshell, that is a, a different, uh, that's a different kind of fallback position, 12 to 15 studio units, a couple of ground floor, floor live, live work, and that becomes an, a, a for rent um, mixed use apartment development, if you will, um, in lieu of, of the six single family for sale, um, kind of walk up brownstones. Oren Marcus said, I don't mean to do all the talking. If I've missed something out, if I've left something out, let me know. No, Kevin, I think that was great. Um, thank you. And, uh, just to kind of reiterate that last point where that, you know, our intention is to propose a site plan and move forward with the site and that's sensitive to the community and that fits in with with the neighborhood um and we hope you guys agree with us on you know kind of our vision here um does just that so uh that, that's really it we're looking forward to kind of hearing from you all and um we'll, we'll leave it at that thank you all right so are there any questions for the applicants of clear clarity before we have the public hearing I have a quick question for the applicant. Yes, go um, ahead, Andres. Have you um, presented or shown your future plans to a community council or neighbors or anything like that, any group like that, uh, about your six planned units? Uh, yes, Andres, we've 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 uh, we have met with and presented at. Uh, two of the greater uh, or the uh, GACC uh, meetings and and have basically discussed everything that you see here and and everything that's that's included in in the staff report and, and definitely done our best to answer uh, as as many questions as we can as possible without without um, you know working you know really in depth and, and getting really granular with the historic landmark commission on on the design process uh but but we definitely feel like we've done what we've can to engage uh the the community uh as best we can to where we're at today so everything and, you've seen here again has, has has been presented to the community council multiple times just to, just to add on to that too andres um we think Mara hopefully has received a um a letter from a board member of the gacc in support of the project um, she let us know that she sent it into John Anderson. Um, I don't know if it's up, you know, in the Dropbox or not, but uh, that should be that should be available soon too. Great, thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions before we move to the public hearing? Okay, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anyone here from the community council? Uh, I do not see a name that is familiar to me from a community council. Um, is there never... anyone else who would like to speak? You can indicate so by using your little hand. We've got a few emails to read. Are these new additional emails? Uh, I believe so, yes. That, that did not appear in the Dropbox? Right. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Becky Bradshaw. We already have parking and traffic issues on 3rd Avenue, especially when it snows. Many residents in the neighborhood do not have off-street parking. I understand that parking will be provided for residents of the project, but for households with more than two cars or have guests, overflow would require street parking. I also understand the plan to remodel the house to the east of the town home. What is the plan for this house? And it's an amazing bit of green space. So again, that was from Becky Bradshaw. The next is from uh, Brandy Dominguez. 
Uh, I'd like to comment on the parking for this property. We already have little to no parking on our street. The homes along the street largely do not have garages or driveways. I understand that there are currently no development proposals submitted, but this <clears throat> streets are far too small to fit multifamily developments. I'd also like to comment on the process for joining these meetings. Flyers sent out were dishonest and misleading. They did not state up front that you would need to register prior to this meeting. These should be accessible to the public. Thank you for your time and consideration. That was from Brandy Dominguez. Uh, we'll clarify that, that you don't actually have to uh, register to join into these meetings. Um, they're open to all. Uh, the next, we did get an email from uh, <clears throat> Jack Glenn um, that is interested in attending the rezoning meeting, but I do not see him in the attendee list. And then our last email is from Nick Gurr. I have concerns about the precedent of changing the zoning of these lots in the historic avenues. The proposed changes harm property values and inherently change the nature of the avenues. Also, I know that this project will displace a single mother with six children. Best regards, Nick Gurr. That is all of the... Uh, actually, we did receive just another email here uh, that just showed up. This is from, <clears throat> it looks like Zach S. Uh, it says, it seems as though you're ignoring the identity and the attitude of the avenues entirely. Uh, this development is yet another step towards eroding the identity, identity, our identity of our city and our communities. Market rate proposal is completely unaligned with the financial reality. The majority of more Salt Lake City residents um, an economic disaster has displaced more people than ever before. And it will be years before these people financially recover. And yeah, make sure this is the right. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you're suggesting money for an area where most people are renting affordably and living comfortably as they have for years, increasing property value at the expense of people's living standards is an unfortunate trend that you have been purporting. That is from uh, Zach. That is. Uh, do, we, do we have a last name on that, Zach? Wayne? I don't. It's just uh, S. Okay. Do we have a policy about people telling us their whole name when they when they uh, testify for us? We've been, um, not necessarily when they come in emails, uh, we've been uh, pretty, um, we use the information that we have. We just want to make sure that we are able to get their public comment and make right. sure that they're heard. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this proposal? I do not see any, any other uh, indication of people wanting to speak. Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the Planning Commission for their comments and a motion. Can I ask either Myra or the applicant a question? Um, what other zoning districts were considered and how did you settle on um, the current proposal. I think I'd better let Oren respond to that. Yeah, I was going to say, Kevin, uh, feel free to kind of talk through some of the other zones. I know we looked at RMF, we looked at keeping it CN. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Oren, we looked at just about everything um, at one at one time or another we looked at uh, obviously this uh, is heavily sr1a um, however there's um, a, a number of different sizes and scales of existing uh, residential projects throughout this area even across the street and to the south of us there are, are apartment buildings so um, rmu we looked at rmu rmu 35 um, we looked at rmf uh, 30 rmf 45 
this army 35 um really offered the great the greatest flexibility because um somebody could come in and buy one of these units and and use it as a live workspace um, they could live on or work on the ground floor have a, a office on the ground floor floor and, and live upstairs um, somebody could buy in a unit and make it purely commercial it just provides a lot of flexibility. Um, it doesn't pigeonhole the city or the planning, uh, the planning commission. Um, it allows for a, a number of uses in the future. And it seemed to be the most appropriate scale to be compatible with um, the other uh, multifamily and, and mixed use developments um, in the immediate area. I can I can offer my planning perspective as well. So from the planning stand uh, view standpoint of view, uh, this the the land, future land use map has this as commercial, um, so appropriate for the avenues area. It would be the CN if it's commercial, and then another option would be a mixed use, which this one is, and then anything mixed use would uh, other than the 35 would be even higher in height. So um, the only things that we considered as far as staff was a CN and the RMU 35. Thank you, that's helpful. I think the other aspect to the RMU 35 um, that uh, the height restriction is 35, um, but that is a that is a flat 35. So um, because we've got about three or four feet of fall across the grade, the actual front of the building along Third Avenue um, will only be about 32 feet tall, whereas the back edge, the south side, is where the 35 would be measured from. And Kevin, can we have a diagram on that? I think I, th I think we had an elevation drawn up that 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 may help everyone yeah, visualize we, that height. We right, we did a quick little cross section study. If everybody can still see my screen, um, this is through Third Avenue, looking east. Uh, this shows the the slope of the grade at um, the proposed property. And this is a, a large house that's across the street that I don't know for how long, but it's been subdivided into four. It, it has four separate entrances. We believe that that's a, like a fourplex. And then um, to the south, what we're not showing is, is a two or two and a half story apartment building. And then to the south of that is this uh, three story apartment building. Um, that's kind of down in the right hand corner. Yeah, the smallest houses are to your east. And, Correct. Yeah. Um, and that would be up gradient from where you are. Right. So um, I'm in, in favor of recommending approval. Um, I'm not in favor of the, the restriction, the condition that planning staff has recommended just because I think it hampers opportunity for a successful development. And I'm not convinced that small scale commercial is actually viable, um, even though this property was used historically for commercial uses. So I don't know how others feel, but that's, that's where I'm leaning. I would agree with you, Adrian. Um, I don't think that this looks like it's going to be especially out of scale for the lower avenues. And I don't think that commercial, a commercial requirement is appropriate. So, um, I think I agree with that as well. My actual concern is a little different, which is, uh, what if one of the units in the middle decided to become a commercial establishment later on? Um, and those folks who have spent, you know, $800,000 for their brand new townhouse found themselves right next to something in the middle that's a coffee shop. 
I mean, for me, Brenda, that sounds fantastic. I'd love to just hop next door and have a great cup of coffee. Well, it might not be a coffee shop. It might be a barber <laughs> shop. It might be, you know, any any number of yeah. places that bring traffic or late night activities into the neighborhood. So um, I'm not quite sure how you mitigate against that. Uh, maybe it's. Uh, has to do with access, accessibility, because um, if things are, um, have, um, um, are accessed through, only through a stair, well, staircase, then they would make it very difficult to be a commercial. commercial. Yeah. And in that regard, um, you know, um, really by, uh, not providing any commercial property on the corner or any options for that, um, then you've really precluded it from being commercial. So there really isn't any flexibility anymore. Is that true? I think, Brenda, wouldn't that, you know, that burden would fall to whomever buys that, that particular unit, whether it's on day one or, or day 1001. They still have to go through a plan review process to make sure that the space that they're buying is ADA compliant, that has all the necessary parking to be compliant with the Salt Lake City zoning requirements. Um, what, what we're proposing doesn't prohibit any of that. And by dictating, in our opinion, by dictating that the corner unit or a portion of it always has to be commercial. To me, that limits the flexibility now as well as in the future. That that's just our our perspective. And we these obviously will be constructed with two hour rated walls. And given the size of the ground floor, there wouldn't be an additional requirement for a fire protection system. Um, even for a small restaurant, cafe, or coffee shop. So, you know, short of a, of a welder moving in there and wanting to do welding, um, th that shouldn't be an issue in terms of building code today anyway. Um, I have a question about the existing home. Is there any off-street parking for that? property or is that something you thought about? Kevin? Yeah, I don't know that they they have off street parking currently. It, um, right, Marcus? It's it's only off street. Yeah, it's only off street parking for them. They don't have any parking on their lot and no access in the back. So they're yeah, it's, on it's street. only on street, yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Which I think is true of most of the houses to the east, no, right? It's not, it's not until you get. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of curb cuts currently with the gas station that would be um, closed off to provide more on street parking as a result. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Right. Okay, are there any more questions? Adrian, would you like to make a... Um... Sure, I'll make a motion. Based on the information listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment as presented in petition PLNPCM 2020-00703. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Maureen, you win. Okay. So I have a propose I have a motion from Adrian and a second from Maureen. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna go through the um, roll call again. Um, so Maureen? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adrian? Yes. Carolyn. Agree. John. Yes. Matt. 
No. No? No. Okay. Andres? I'll vote yes. Sarah? I vote no. We have six, um, four and two against, and so the motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda. I just wanted to confirm, is the condition for the commercial that will be taken that off? Was, that was not in the motion. That was not in the motion. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Hope everyone has a good night. We appreciate the time. Thank you. So there are not being any, I'm not seeing any additional items to the agenda. So I'm going to go ahead and um, adjourn the meeting. Unless anyone else has something to say. <laughs> okay.